all of most mid laners just have an Orianna, right? And Fakers is one of the best in the world. Speaking of orbs, though, the Syndra is going to be locked away here as well for APA. And Pyoshik, <laughs> oh my, he's hovering the Hecarim. This is, of course, what gave T1 nightmares. He's beginning, he's beginning at least the emotional warfare, Chronicler. And I really appreciate the Lee lock in. I think that the Lee Syndra combination obviously has a lot of power in the 2v2. Uh, and I agree I, uh, with the desk as well. I think T1 or TL rather needs to try and go as hard in on early game as you can. Because uh, when you get to late, things might become a little bit dire. And it also picks it away from Owner. Owner has, I think, been the consistent weak point Whoa. for T1 in summer as the Ash is locked in here. Now, there are, of course, some possibilities for that to be a flex. But if the Renata locked in, we will, in fact, be certain of where this is going, and it's going to be Renata and Ash. Uh, and the Renata is <laughs> not something that was high in priority. No, we have seen a little bit of it. and But the thing is, Renata is often used as an answer pick, not a blind pick. Yeah. It is something that Carrier has been absolutely fantastic on throughout his career, but not recently, and definitely not in this situation, as there is Aphelios locked in for Yun. And I'm not... Not a huge Aphelios fan at this particular point in time, but we'll see what they have planned for this Ash Renata lane, which is extraordinarily face-up. Yeah, I wonder if T1 is going to try and lock to ban away uh, some other enchanters, because the point of the Ash Renata lane is to just bully, right? You want to yep. try and play as aggressive as possible. Depending on the build, we can see Ash do some, some decent damage, but you will always be threatened. I think the Syndra in that way uh, definitely is something that they're going to have to take into account as the J4 is a band away. J4 Oriana, classic combo, has been around yep. for the longest time. And J4 in general is in a really good spot right now. Um, T1, though, not looking towards the bot lane, seemingly happy with the dominance of that Ash and Renata. Instead, banning away some picks here, which <laughs> is, uh, it's looking like it might just be a blind Renekton here uh, for Zeus. Well, we'll see whether he is going to be able to get his hands on it, of course. It will be Summit hey. that has the first option. Speaking of Summit champions, two of them have been taken away, the prehistoric Yordle and the electric one. See whether it is going to be more Summit tax that's going to get paid. Things like the Aatrox are coming to mind, but there is the Blitzcrank taken away, protecting that bottom lane just a little bit. And I, I, I do think that there is a crocodile in our future. Um, it's what I'm kind of feeling here. Or, Kasante, of course, still up and available as well and did see a lot of priority, but instead, looks like Core JJ thinking about a favorite here. As Tarek as well. Tarek a little bit of a sleeper at this point in time, but right now Core is still considering his options. Yeah, shouldn't come as a surprise. Uh, Rel, though, uh, going to be the lock-in in the end. Rel, obviously, uh, I think one of the strongest picks of the tournament thus far. Incredible. A flex pick as well. You just uh, oh, put Lee Sin yeah, top lane. Yeah, I, I, I knew you were going to bring it up. I mean, it's in my you pickums, man. I need Lee Sin to be played all over the place. Uh, we'll see uh, whether that will come to fruition. It is looking like a blind pick here. Uh, the Sejuani, uh, I'm sure, will pair with whatever Zayus is picking. But outside of that, not really the greatest uh, when you look at the rest of the comp of T1. Not a lot of ways to activate that. You don't uh -huh. have a uh, uh, a melee uh, mid or a melee support to try and play with this. Jax. I, I'm, I, it's looking like Jax or Renekton, yeah. Um, Kassante could also be an option, but I do think that with Ash in particular, Kassante maybe doesn't quite have the pressure, uh, and you would be leaning a lot more on just the Orianna for late game damage, as that is, oh, that's no. one of his champions. And, but like, this is the problem, we see this all the time, and it's the Sejuani without any permafrost friends. And I just, I, I don't know, it bothers me quite a lot. Of course, you can go into hammer form as half Jace of to Jace try and help can out. Help. Half of Jace, exactly. So, Ona has half a help with his passive uh, and getting that one stacked up. But of course, Sejuani is just good in general. There is a Kasante on the R5 for Summit. You can see, I can see a smirk there, a wry smile on his face as he manages to get probably the most successful top lane champion uh, of the planes, at least, that we've seen uh, on this patch here at Worlds. So I do like what TL have put together, but T1, I mean, this is the most slow and steady T1 composition. Like, we're going to team fight you and we have all of the engage in the universe and we can follow up with everything and the kitchen sink. But I don't know whether they're necessarily answering TL, at least in this draft, in the early game.
Yeah, I, I think that for T1, um, playing around that bot side is going to be really important. And in that light, I think a Renekton would have made a lot of sense because you can leave him alone on an island and be fine. However, the Jace might be drawing some attention. Obviously, the 2v2 with your uh, Lee Sin is going to be good in both mid and top. Uh, and, and as mentioned, the Sejuani, I don't know how good you're going to feel about that unless you're playing Fruseus, but with uh, the pressure that Gumiyushi and Karia are expected to have, I think T1 is going to try and leverage that to set up early objectives. And it is really hard to engage into the T1 comp, and I do think that there is a lack of range on Liquid. The Renata in particular actually working out really well there, uh, but... If you can catch the T1 comp off guard, right, and particularly with something like yeah. the Jace, can definitely be a, a big problem. And I do think TL have a very well-rounded comp. Um, that said, if they're not able to make anything happen around that mid-jungle or mid-top or a top jungle rather, I'd still be worried for them. I feel like there's going to have to be a lot resting on Summit's shoulders this time around as well. But it is time. Let's get into our very first game of the Swiss stage here at Worlds. 2023, T1 taking on TL. Their acronyms, so very similar. We'll see whether the gameplay is going to be on a similar level as we get into it. Any expectations for level one, Chronicler? With these, you could try. I think that uh, Ash can be really punishing, right, if you're able, but if this was like a Braum instead of a Renata, you know, you're, you're, you're going ham. It's Karius Braum. I don't, uh, I, don't, I don't want you to say that ever again. Hey, uh, Karius Braum, when he's not engaging, is great. <laughs> um, when, when he is engaging, it, uh, it, it it's it's not necessarily the greatest. But no, I, I do think that the first action we're going to see more so towards the, uh, the Dragons, the Heralds. And again, particularly for TL, I want to see how well Pioshik and APA are able to try and play and how are they going to relieve pressure? Because with this Ash Carrier, or uh, rather Ash Renata lane, my expectation is that T1 is looking to start bullying very early on and never really relent. And uh, we have seen that T1, this goes back to spring, but that was the style that they were extremely dominant oh, in yeah. and uh, allowed them to snowball games in a uh, very unfun experience for their opponents. But now the Ash player has changed. Very true. Uh, in this lane, as of course, Keria moving over to the Renata this time around. Ash not necessarily a sport as much as she used to be, as the logistics program is being read out to Yun, and he didn't like it at all. Um, not not into it, it. No. No, not an, uh, not an enjoyer of the program. Did go Fleet Footwork, so we'll be able to sustain up a little bit, but do have to be ready for the amount of pressure that's going to come out from this lane early on. And, Especially when you're playing engage support, Renata is a bit of a you know middle of the pack because she's an enchanter, but also really good in terms of counter engage. Uh, is that you want to really respect the level one so that you actually have a window to go in. And if your health bar is already too low, then that's not really going to be the case. Uh, case in point. Yeah, there's a bit of a handshake there from Carrier. Is going to get cleansed. So gets a cleanse on a level one Aphelios. Things not necessarily going. Uh, TL's way here at this stage, but as you already illustrated, this is to be expected uh, in that lane. Zayus is going to go to the skies, and Summit is going to look to try and fight back here, but Conqueror procced, and the Jace is having just a great time. Oh, and Owner actually oh, uh, changes his another one thing. comes through, and now the Flash Carrier is just throwing out abilities and getting Summoner spells. Do note, though, Pioshek starting on the upside of the map. We're going to have opposite sides here, as there might be a dive onto Summit, but Guma and Carrier, are they going to be okay with Pioshik moving in? Yeah, Summit trying to deal with this minion wave, but it is just too big. They do manage to get a teleport out. Can they kill him in time? That is going to be the one for one, as now the stun comes in. It's a two for one, and TL trade up. Now Pioshik making his move towards the bottom side. The Q's going to land. Gumiyushi's in so much trouble, and Core JJ just said, I, I take down this team, it's my job, man. And TL coming up huge early. Yes, Yawn and Core get pushed in, but it seems like T1 wasn't ready for the gang coming in from Bioshik straight from his red buff down to the bot side. And then here, I think Owner just a little bit slow. It actually gives plenty of time for Summits to level up, regain some health, and then level three this early on, you just can't tank the turret. And if that's a, that's a one for one trait, maybe you take it, but now it's a big win. And then here as well. Oh, the flash. That's very unfortunate there for Gumiyushi. Getting caught in the CC regardless. Core JJ just crashing down on him. And we're starting off with a 3 1 in favor of TL. And I want to go back to uh, a conversation that I had with Jat. He re uh, referred to this earlier on. And we, we were having the chat, and I, I, was, I was telling him, like, 
if the game goes, TL gets an early lead and then T1 stabilizes in the mid game and wins, do you think that that's an expected outcome? And he was like, yes. Um, but the other option is TL just keeps up the pressure. They just keep going and then they win. Or they, you know, there could be a throw situation or something like that. Zayas is fighting against Summit here towards his top side. Still, Summit not having the greatest of times up here, but Ona, I mean, he, he's got a pretty nice tent up here, as it turns out. He does. And we'll see if this uh, dive tent is better. Pioshik will get spotted, so I think that should be enough reason to maybe call it off. But I think the goal for T1 here is just to deny uh, as much GS and experience as possible, maybe pick up a plate as well, and they will be able to do that. But uh, with Pioshik having to top side, dive not going to be repeated here. And yeah, T1 clearly uh, came into this game trying to play as lane dominant as possible. And I think TL's response thus far, not too bad. But when you look at the CS, even with the play towards bot side, you do see that the dues are still being paid and that this Ash uh, Renata lane is still really oppressive to play into because Yon is still very far behind in CS. And when we look at the actual gold, it's been equalized. Yeah, it certainly has. Uh, in this mid lane, APA has been playing fantastically. Of course, didn't play a whole lot this year for TL. And there's a Shockwave. As I say it, he takes a whole bunch of damage, so perhaps the Caster Curses could just stop. And Pyoshik looking for an opportunity here onto the Sejuani. He's going to be spotted there on the Control Ward, and Ono just says, no thank you, not again. Gumiushi is going to find some Frost Shots onto Core JJ, gets the crash down, but Pyoshik is still just trying to run away from Ona. Doesn't get the Arctic Assault over the wall. Faker was coming down, not going to be able to find him. So far, relatively smooth sailing here for TL, but we haven't seen any more of those aggressive plays that T1 tried to pull off in the early stages, and I think that we're probably just going to see some cool, calm and collected gameplay, try and get these lanes worked out, and then uh, set up for some of these objectives. And I think that's the biggest difference. Even with the early gang or the early kills going the way of TL, we already have two plates down in top, one plate down in bot as well. So T1 are able to still trade pretty decently in terms of gold. Pioshik also, the cons uh, constant attention that he has had to pay to his lanes has been working out right. Forwarded the gank on top side, forwarded the gank just now on bot. Uh, because I think that the uh, owner might have otherwise had an angle with yep. the complete vision denial. But it also has meant that he hasn't really been able to have the early impact. And with Lee specifically, particularly against something like a Sejuani, you're really trying to be on the front foot. You're trying to be proactive. Once you're playing reactive into Sejuani, it's not the end of the world. Uh, we have seen Lee's be able to still have a big impact when we get to the later stages of the game. But uh, it does mean that uh, TL, playing mostly responsive, are still going to suffer when it comes to these plates and to the CS. Yeah, and here on the bottom side of the map, um, you were talking about plates going down on the top side. Uh, minions just being denied here. The Ashranada, of course, pretty good at it. But uh, Gumi Ishikaria, um, oppressive early games, kind of their bread and butter. And it looks to be going just fine here at this point. Summit, good ward. Should be able to spot out owner as he moves on in, and there it goes. Maybe Gets a 2 ward down, But this could be some uh, Summit baiting here towards his top side as Pyoshik is making his way in. The back is going to come through, and now Pyoshik's going to know that he'll have an opportunity. Full vision in this area. Isaias is going to move his way down. Feels a little bit frightened as to what could be the possibilities. Pyoshik paying some attention. No Shock Blast going to make its way into the tri brush just yet. Zayas does turn back up again. On vision. Summon us all. There it is. And now Pyoshik is coming down. There the all out comes through. The Q's going to land. And Zayas, he knows that he's dead. The Q's going to land beforehand. And Pyoshik gets another. Really nice setup there. The early ward from Summit showcasing where Owner is. And Summit with the Cassante has the capability to drag Zayas back. Set him up for Pyoshik. Much needed kill. TL, I think, needs to make this game as fast as possible. Needs to try and throw T1 off. They are now on vision, starting up this objective. Core and Yon are already here, but with the wave that's being bu uh, built up on bot side, I wouldn't be surprised if T1 just goes for the blades. Arrow coming in. Yeah, Ona is going to get blocked out, so Pyoshik is going to be able to take this one. The arrow is going to connect, but Yon is going to be able to cleanse that one away. Ona's still looking for more. As the shockwave lands, Pyoshik is going to try and safeguard his way up, and the hostile takeover will cancel that, and Faker will grab his first of the game. TL trading the 
Rift Herald for just a kill. You're probably all right with it. Alternative, uh, Summit also went and caught that bot wave. Uh, now they are um, continuing the play. I, APA does have teleport. Yeah, four versus three, potentially. No more shockwaves, so they don't have to worry about that orb quite as much. So APA will be able to keep his friends alive for now. Very nicely done, and I'm starting to feel like, you know, TL doing okay. I was a bit worried about that uh, that Herald play, absolutely. But right now, the goal is very, trade. very even. And we'll see where they place down the Herald. Uh, haven't really been able to do a whole lot of damage to turrets outside of a plate in mid. APA, at least in the laning phase, doing a good job here. And if they can actually use that to maybe uh, set up a dive right towards that mid lane and go from there, could be big. As we take another look at this, I really like the setup for this play. Uh, Zeus went to pick up some fruit, comes back and is uh, delivered into the waiting arms of Pioshik. And this is basically a zero risk play for TL because they knew where owner had been. And then here, you know, you end up giving up a kill, but I do agree with you. I think you take that any time. The value that Harrow provides is going to be very nice. And uh, with the mobility and the core standing guard, uh, even though they do have to invest two flashes, giving up one kill, not the end of the world. The flashes, though, if we do have another fight coming up soon, that might be a problem. Well, we'll see when that fight is going to occur. Currently, no dragons have been secured. Um, of course, there's only one dragon at this point in time. However, has not been looked at just yet. Yeah. OJJ well, looking for this top side of the map as Ona is in position. Bit of a lane swap has come on through as Summit getting punished here underneath the turret. Another plate could fall, but no, the minion is going to be dealt with. Kamushi's going to have to wait for the next round, but I don't know how much more of this Summit can actually take, and he just used his teleport to get down there. And I think Summit should still be relatively safe, but if he's not getting any help, uh, he can try and clear. Uh, Zeus might be targeted here again. Does a flash available? Yeah, you're gonna connect there from Yana's. Now Zeus realizing that Core JJ's there. He's gonna flash out of the way. Oh my goodness, Core JJ almost falls, but not quite enough there from Zeus to make him take two turret shots. Could have been a disaster. However, no one is going to fall, and Zeus does have to use his flash. We do have uh, Pioshik making his way over, even with owner being there. Looks like TL, at the very least, is going to drop the Herald here. Yep, there is the Glacial Prison. Yun is going to be able to get out of the way. The arrow is going to sail by majestically, and the Rift Herald is going to slam its way through. Moonlight Vigil comes down, still a lot of damage offered back here by T1, and that will deter TL from coming on through here, but still, Plate Gold does go over. Such a good response though by T1 because TL trying to overload the top half of the map, not actually getting the kills. I hope we get some replays because there was a lot of nice work done there by TL or T1 rather to dodge all the skill shots, make sure that Zeus stayed alive. Um, but on the flip side of the map, Guma and Karia can just keep going. Karia just went yeah. for the offensive ignite just to keep Summit as low as possible. And it does mean that even with the Herald, gold will be slightly in favor of T1. But thus far, Early game has actually gone even, and I do want to highlight, I think T1, the reason why, uh, although we talk about it after this, because again, I want to highlight, we don't get to see Zeus sidestepping the Magnet Storm, that was really cool, but here they're able to clear out the wave, and uh, even though the arrow doesn't actually find anyone, Zeus gets the knockback, and Owner then makes sure that he catches the Moonlight Vigil to keep his top laner alive. Yeah, the knockback right as the kick is yeah. coming through as well to deny any sort of follow-up. Really cleanly played there defensively by T1. Not going to be able to net them any kills, only a 500 gold lead here, which is nothing to write home about whatsoever. Although postage pretty easy currently for most of the players on the Rift. Some are just clearing out waves. I do want to see TL keep up the tempo yeah, I agree. Uh, here in this game. And I want to see a little bit more out of APA. Of course, the Syndra, fantastic for just one-shotting carries, things like this. But as the game goes on, the utility that Orianna provides is going to give a little bit more from that mid lane. It's hard to match. Also looking together how we can sync up with Core. I think that the crash down combined with a scatter yeah. of the week can single-handedly uh, win you a team fight. As Yon does have red white. Yeah, Q gonna connect there from Pyoshik, but Owner is gonna be able to arctically assault his way out. And now this dragon is getting some attention. Wards everywhere. Arrow going to connect onto APA. The hostile takeover comes through, and there is the chaining of CC. I don't know what you're supposed to do in that moment. I think you just have to accept that you're gonna die. That's precisely what happens. Yeah, I think you have to flash the arrow. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that's that's really the only uh, outplay on that one. APA unfortunately going down. Close. <laughs> uh, summit. 
gets himself a snack. First rake is going to go over to, to uh, setting up for a cloud, which I am loving. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, Earth, Wind, and Fire? I know. To That's start your off favorite. the Swiss stage? It's not my birthday. So, come on. Yeah, as we uh, take a look at the uh, Moscow Lane Economy snapshot, the big benefactor of everything that has happened thus far is Guma, because while uh, Jan has, has been dragged around the map, right? They did the lane swap yep. to get the Herald. Uh, they tried some aggressive plays, but didn't quite work out. Um, Guma has just been in bot. Fired two arrows. That was about it in here. Yeah. Uh, you have to flash it. Otherwise, especially with owner right there, just going to get taken down 100%. And that is exactly the type of plays you want to try and avoid. Give T1 as little as possible in this mid game because comp team fight. I don't even think TL's comp is bad at team fighting, but trying to out team fight T1. Yeah, with the composition that they have, especially on top of everything, they've got yeah. so much non-committal CC as well as teamfight utility. It's there a is, risk. There's just a little bit too much here. Um, so TL going to be able to look at Shirley here. Going to be able to take her down. Looks like T1 not too interested in fighting for this one as they have some back timers to take care of beforehand. So Pyoshik going to get his second Rift Herald. TL should be able to try and use this to break open one of these lanes. Currently, they haven't taken any turrets just yet. The bot lane outer has fallen, so first brick goes to T1, contributing to their gold advantage that they do have to the tune of about a thousand. Arrow going to fly through, hits carrier, hits owner, and almost hits APA. This time he's going to flash it. That's uh, that's very unfortunate because uh, even though he stays alive in this instance, the might try to oh. go for a play on Zayus here. Wait, yeah, there's the scat of the week on Zayus, taking a lot of damage. The unleashed power comes through, and Pyoshik's going to take away the kill. Just barely not enough there, so requiring the Sonic Wave, but really nicely done here right after he had to burn the flash. He was necessary, okay? Pyoshik was essential to that play. Really nicely done by APA, able to get the best out of a bad situation. Zayus going down a third time now. And means that TL still remaining close in gold. And because top lane turret was already low from the continuous pressure that was applied there by TL, they're able to get the top side uh, turret. Might be looking towards play on Faker. Pyoshik does have his ult. Yeah, there is the Warthog flash. Scatter the weak, not going to be able to get the stun there, though, as Pyoshik is going to be the target here. Faker wanting some revenge, gets the flash out of him in trade for the Shockwave, as now Zayas is looking to put in some support as well. Not going to be able to catch up. TL with three man strong here in the mid lane against the three of T1. Oh, the flash forward from Zayas is going to be scattered. APA doesn't have a flash of his own, though, as the Shockwave was looking to grab Pyoshik, but they'll get the free kill on the Syndra. APA not able to make his way out. And particularly on such a long lane, between the speed up from Faker plus the speed up from Jace, as Cole goes in. Storm. That is going to be the hostile takeover, though. It's Gumushi's just raining hell down on Core JJ. He's going to be the first one to fall, but Summit does get the all out on the carrier not going to be able to bail himself out of this one bit too expensive but the q3 is going to connect and now gamushi's in trouble the arrow is going to connect onto young but it was summit that was the problem and tl will answer back beautifully in mid and tl not scared of what's happening in top side immediately pulled the trigger in mid you saw guma there as well i think a second of hesitation like oh can i maybe help carry out can we try and chew through this Cassante. Uh, the answer would have been no, but that moment of hesitation, Summit is able to completely capitalize on. And initially, it's a bit of a question, do you have enough damage with just the Cassante there? But fortunately, even with Caria able to stall out the play a little bit, Summit able to make his way over, get on top of Caria. The bailout, not going to be enough to save him. And actually predicting, right? Gumayushi trying to dodge the Q3 coming up huge. Well done there, and it means that still 18 minutes in, gold looking even. Now Core JJ will find Ona. He's going to get a shattering strike off as Gushik looking for Faker underneath the turret. He's going to get kicked into the wall as APA will just unleash the power and is going to reign supreme as far as the Orb Ladies concerned in this game. Summit. Be able to get himself into this mid lane once again, but that one is not long for the world, especially with this large minion wave. Someone's just gonna have to watch it fall down. Ona just provides some support as well. And the map, something that TL hasn't necessarily paid as much attention to as the handshake does come through. That's gonna be a miss on the glacial prison, though. And so Summit's gonna survive, but the inner turret is not. Yeah, T1 is really playing with reckless a bit. Like we haven't seen this since uh since spring. They're yeah. just 
giving up people left and right just to try and get these objectives. Owner might be in a tough spot. Yeah, there's the uh, scat of the week, but TL not wanting to buy it off more than they can chew, especially with Yun not quite there yet. The dragon will be big, and T1 is set up around this objective. Not the best weapons here for Yun. See if he can get, but... There's no Faker, right? No TP available. Yeah, that's going to be Pyoshik locking that one down. It is going to be a Cloud Soul this game as well, so I guess it is my birthday. I don't need any more of those, though. I'm I'm, I'm getting old. I'm loving it. Yeah. Earth, Wind, and Fire, everyone. Let's groove tonight as Gumiyushi can be clearing out this midwave. Let's have a look at the replay once again. There's quite a few things to get through. And the big thing here is that as we wanted to see from TL, they are continuously going for plays. And uh, you see here the power, like what, what do you do as Faker? Particularly if you don't have Flash or any backup, they, you can't outplay that. The moment that Pioshik lands the kick, APA guarantees the scatter, and the damage is always going to be enough, Merc treads or no. And it's the kills where TL really has been able to get the better of T1. Now both these teams have a habit uh, when it comes to, uh, to Barons. Yeah, and um, very recently it's been far more uh, TL that have been, been going yeah. for those. In their playoffs, they were reminding us of some T1 of old. Just, it's hit 20 minutes. Baron's on the map. Let's go there. Why and not? And let's try and kill it. Um, it hasn't necessarily been T1's MO towards the end of this year, though. Um, but, of course, they've had a fair few struggles there, so maybe some of the confidence played into that. T1 now going to have the opportunity to look over there, and they can at least clear out some vision. So as it stands, I want to like pull us back a little bit, Chronicler. Yeah, we're, we're, there's been a Chat lot going on. Chat said 90-10 on the desk. Mm -hmm. Yes. Current game state, where are you putting it now? Knowing the two teams, I don't know, like 70-30? That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Look at us. It's like we've you know, I, it together I, before, and we know a bit TL, about each other. TL thus far, really been able to keep it together. Now, what I'm worried about is um, the burst from, I think, the top half of the map uh, Summit, Pioshik, and, and APA right now is enough to take down anyone on T1. But once we get into the actual team fights, the fact that Yon is really far behind, I think might actually end up becoming a problem. It depends on whether or not TL can get access to Guma Yushi, whether they can deny Karia a big ultimate, make sure that Guma doesn't get bailed out uh, by the Renata, because I do think that when you look at the damage, T1 definitely has so much burst available to them. Uh, but then also on top of that, you have the sustained damage of an Ash, who even with the deaths that Guma has sustained, picked up, I don't know how many plates it was, but uh, yeah, a it's, lot. it's a lot. And that's a, that's a, that's a 50 CS gap, basically, uh, for Gumishi as well. And so he's just, uh, just happy Ash. Died a couple of times, but it doesn't really matter because the bank coffers are still full. Faker with control of this barren area, gonna make his way towards the jungle. It is extraordinarily empty at this point in time. Ona finds Summit. And Summit just gonna go back towards this bottom side of the map and try and clear up these minion waves. Core JJ finds Faker once again. Shattering Strike going to come through, but he's gonna be pulled back by the Shockwave. The Dissonance comes in, there's the Magnus Storm. As Faker is pulled forward, can he find the Clockwork Windup? He doesn't need it, because he's got Command Attack, and that is going to be the kill going over. Carrier gets an assist as well and managed to get the shield down, but I'm gonna almost give it a solo kill as Yun gonna have to get out of the way of that one once again. Glacial Prison in trade for the cleanse. And T1 not pulling the trigger, so it's just going to be a kill. Uh, not the end of the world for TL, but if you do this a few minutes later, if maybe more members of T1 are in the area, uh, I, I don't think you're gonna get away with just a kill in that situation. And this is where you see Faker went for Ludens as well as Void Staff. So even against uh, one of the tankier members of TL, you just shred for him in seconds. Uh, Faker actually investing in flash, uh, his flash here. Uh, otherwise the arrow might have been enough. Uh, if Guma can get that as all oh, the teleport here. Yeah, now Faker, as you just mentioned, does not have his flash available. The Dissonance doing a fair bit of work there because of the damage build. As Scatter the Weak is not gonna quite find the man in the mid lane. Kosh is going to get slowed down, but he connects the Q, and I have a feeling that even Fake is not going to be able to make his way out of this one. He's had some daring escapes before, but without Flash, Ariana doesn't exactly have too many methods. And now, the TL Baron that we were just talking about, they're going to consider it here. The rest of T1 are in the area. Faker has teleport. There's 30 seconds 
on TL to make this play. And if they can lock this down, it could be a huge advantage for them. They need to keep Owner out of this pit, though, as APA, he's going down low. Core JJ looking for his opportunity. Can he play bouncer? They get him out of the pit. And it's going to be Pjocic that locks down the Baron. Can they win the fight, though, is the question. Arstyle takeover gets the kill, utilizing Yun to kill APA. It's a disaster for TL and Zayas. He knows it. He's flashing over walls. Yun's going to be able to pick up one, though, with these Chakrams. I have a feeling that that might be all he's going to be able to get, but let's see what he can do here. Uses the last of his mana on the Moonshot. And, uh, yeah, he's in an alcove, and I don't know whether he's getting out unless it's via the Death Chamber. So there it is. Going to be the kill lockdown by Zayas. Faker TP to bot. Oh, as, yeah, he knew uh, that yeah, one was done. <laughs> Um, Bioshik and TL are able. I think they actually played that really well. The initial setup around the objective is amazing. As oh, oh, this is this is so Bioshik. Oh, is it's he the last Baron? Is he I don't the know last Baron? This. Okay, let's see what can happen here. Bioshik's trying to safeguard his way out. Summit is here, but it's a little bit late. As Bioshik, he cannot contribute to this, but it is a Kazanti in melee there. range. But Kumiyushi is just so dangerous. Huh, the volleys are connecting, and Summit's going to be okay. So no is T1, and I guess nothing really happens. This is the type of game I want to kick off Swiss stage. At least a lot is going on, and it starts off. If you're a T1 fan, you've seen this one before, but this time around, there is no cross map play. There is no grand plan. Faker just dies. Uh, I, and I really like the proactive use of teleport here from Team Liquid to then set up the Baron. The downside is there is still four people for T1, and a lot of resources have to be invested to take out Owner. The poke from Ash and Jace is so pivotal. I actually would have loved it if TL here oh, just go it. all in on the engage. Right, Summit's because all out it was absolutely fantastic. It was to get rid of Ono because the, the follow up engage from T1 is a disaster for Liquid, right? And if they also had gotten the Baron, it would have been a, uh, a complete wash. But instead, I think TL the fact that they are able to hold on to one of their Baron buffs is nice, but um, I don't think that, yeah, it's a, it's a minus 600 Baron power play. The yeah. Rebel Baron power play has seen. Better, Better days. days. Yeah, it's a somewhat. It's not exactly the greatest debut of the Rebel Baron power play for the Swiss stage. However, um, we'll see what can happen here as Pioshik still has the buff for another 40 odd seconds. Scatter the weak, not going to find owner there. Proving himself strong, I guess. And Summit going to clear out this mid lane. Still out in the mid lane, up and available here. TL going to have to try and break that one open. The map really has been their worst enemy as T1 have uh, really opened it up for themselves. And I think that's starting to provide a bit of a problem here for the North American representatives. And for TL, not getting anything out of this Baron is unfortunate. It, it, it goes both ways, right? Hey, they if take you, it off the map. That is true. Know? And that against T1 in particular, I think that is valid. At the same time though, the standing gold can be a, a blessing and a curse. If you ever do get a decisive team fight win, you immediately can uh, balloon up to uh, pretty ridiculous amounts, particularly if you would have had the Baron buff still on the, anyone that wasn't Bioshik. But at the same time, it also means the map control and safety that T1 still has because of that mid lane turret makes it really hard. Because I do think TL, every fight should start with a pickoff, maybe on Faker. Yeah. Bioshik deep in enemy territory. Going for it there as the kick does come through. Of course, Sonic Wave is going to connect as well. Core JJ looks for the opportunity, but the hostile takeover is there. Carrier always takes care oh. of his friends. It's Bioshik. He even goes golden. Going to be able to avoid the arrow with that. The rest of TL gets into position. This is tw 2022 Worlds. Bioshik, like, he's, this is incredible. He's doing it. He's doing it um, again, Chronic. No, it's just, it's just an inner. I mean, and it's also just one play. Yeah. But, like, we like to get excited about these sorts of plays. We should. Exactly. Man, we, we've been deprived the pleasure of casting Pioshik for a full year. Um, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to enjoy it. Same. Hey, um, guys, are you going to enjoy it, Chad? I, this is intense. Yeah. I just have to say, I, I think TL has a, a small chance of winning this Whoa. one, but it's small. Are we, how, I don't want to destroy okay, how, how are you feeling? We upgraded to 70-30. Where are you going? So my heartbeat is currently at 125 BPM, according yeah, to my watch. I think watch. mine's 140. And that's probably lower than what some of these TL guys are at right now. Piosic <laughs> is playing out of his mind. He actually feels pretty calm to me. So this is, the, this is the problem with Team Liquid, though. And I hope they've been able to overcome in the last two months. They've had so many early games where they were ahead or behind in gold. And this feels like a classic NA versus Korea game where they feel like they're getting all these kills. But no matter what, they are behind in gold. They get Baron, they're still behind in gold. But I will say that does give you that slimmer of hope. And I just, I had to express my excitement. No, yeah, of course. No, you're, you're, you're sticking very around, right? 
if you want me to. No, I don't want to Absolutely. No, no, no. This isn't we're going to hear from Jat standing by. This is now we're, Now it's a trika. So welcome. And uh, I'm we'll here for see. The, for we'll the Jatless reunion? <laughs> I feel oh, like man, you've been it was doing, 2019 the last you, time. You've been doing an ago. amazing job. But look at this. This is rare that after 25 minutes, TL gains gold on T1. Yeah. The gold difference, overtime powered by AWS, letting us know that, yeah, T1's macro is still pretty good. I, I'm going to be looking as well towards the uh, death cap finishes. Both Faker and APA are getting really, really close. And at that point, if anyone gets caught by anything, be it a, a stray out from owner, uh, be it uh, Pioshik going insanely deep, as he has been doing throughout the entirety of this game, and you're going to get blown up in seconds, and we'll see whether the AD carries are able to really yeah. make their mark on this game. And I really do have to wonder about Jan at the moment. He's been on the back foot this entire game. I feel like they banned the Caitlyn really early on in the draft phase because they were scared of the laning phase. But then they had to go with the team fight pick for Core JJ because I don't think they felt like they'd be able to win this game with Core on something like Lulu against Ash Renata where they might lose the lane anyway. So he's down 60 CS. He's been on the back foot the whole game. And he has to worry about Shock Blast and Orianna Shockwave. So it's such a difficult game for him. But the fact that he has two summoner spells up right now before this next Dragon or Baron fight would be the window where he has to execute in a team fight to give TL an advantage. And I want to reiterate again, the best of ones in Swiss are so important because it seeds you for the rest of the bracket, right? A win here yeah. today means that you're only a single win away from making it towards those best of threes, the ability to win. And, and right now, TL is looking to peel. They're hoping to get the teleport and then oh, peel. They do not want to flip Aria this. is just going to get caught out of position. Call JK Let's go. is there, and that is going to be the pickoff to stop this one. Even the Rift Skull is going to be the kick on the Faker from Pioshek. It does not stop from this man today. And Ona down to 50%. Of course, Summit's got the Q3, and it's Summit's a double gone. for APA, and that's going to be a Baron for TL. Piosik is legitimately the defending world champion, getting two kills for TL, no jungler for That's T1. That's the second Baron of the game. Two for two for Liquid. I'm giving it at least 50-50 now, boys. 100%. That is going to be the secure of the Baron. And I have a feeling this Rebel Baron power play is going to be a bit bigger than the last one. And Pioshik in the quote says, we're going to have fun. You know, when we're, it's not looking good. <laughs> it looks pretty fun if you're not He's a He's great fan. time. I will say. Uh -huh. <laughs> One of the Achilles heels of Team Liquid during the regular season was their execution of Baron Power. Get, so get out of here, Jet. I have to watch Jet. this. I have to keep hope low. That's how we got here in the first place. But right here, Core JJ never showed. T1 did approach because they didn't have perfect vision on the Baron. They get the first kill. That and Kyosik on the TP was godlike. Man. And he's got the GA ready. So he's able to get that resurrection through as well. And so Ona just going to be caught out. T1, once the cards start falling down, this composition can fall apart. And TL, as you can see, understandably losing their minds. And, and they know what this means. Look, with this new format, this one win, as Chronicler is mentioning, is way more important than one win in the six game group stage. Because it will actually catapult them in to being one best of one away from a qualification match. It's actually much more important. And that's going to remain true for the next two best of ones, and right? Like, if they do win here. We know there's always crazy upsets in the world, right? Every year, uh, victims are never the way that you'd expect. Never. But to open the Swiss stage, if they can make it happen, will be incredible. Right now, though, Baron Powerplay actually working out okay. Ooh, Summit, Summit has to be able to escape this. Trying to get out of the way, but the Glacial Prison is going to connect. The arrow is going to sail wide. He tries to all out his way through. Does still have a bit of a shield, but Faker will finish him off now. Still needed a lot of resources to lock that one down as Baron is going to be utilized to try and take down this inner turret as well. But T1 going to get themselves into position. The volley is going to tag them. Not going to push into the fog of war is T1. They're trying to just holster their guns a little bit here. Yeah, Yon cleansing the slow there just to ensure that there was no follow-up. And he's able to make his way out. And Pioshek still going, still looking continuously for this backline axis. Faker does have no TP, so it technically is a 4v4, which I think is why he's trying to play aggressive. And they don't want to lose this Baron. With Summit being dead for another 20 seconds, he'll join once he has teleport. But that's actually been the issue. Summit led the LCS in isolated deaths. And so many of those did happen in situations like this, where he's pushed up, and the team isn't able to counter the play of T1 sending everybody for Summit. So that completely stops yeah, that, the momentum of this Baron power play. And it's been a problem all year for TL. That, that one goes back uh, a few years before yeah. that as well. I say as, a sand, uh, as an old fan fan as as you point out jet it's it's the fact that the rest of the team is backing while yep. he is this far up 
Uh, and this kind of takes out the pretty decent Baron power play they were setting up. They were about 1,500 up here, maybe could have gotten another inner if they synced it up a little bit better. But now, for all accounts, gold, 2k at this point in the game, not going to be the, bi uh, the big difference maker. 100% irrelevant. Two dragons apiece now as well as TL were at least able to collect themselves their first Cloud Drake of the game. So we're not talking about a soul just yet until this next one is going to be taken down in two and a half minutes. But the Baron is going to be the conversation at that point in time. TL, we'll see whether it's three uh, Barons that they'll require as these Shock Blasts, man. They hurt so much. Yon working on what looks to be a Guardian Angel. It'll allow him to play a little bit more aggressive, but you can see he's just so far behind the curve of Ash. Uh, Chronicler, I'm having a hard time being uh, unbiased with my analysis right now. Who do you think has better scaling? Just champion-wise. Um, I'm... I'm, oh, Arrow. APA. oh, APA just walks out of it. I'm leaning T1 because I think Orianna right now is the best team fighting major you can get. Fair. But if Pioche can find an angle, like I, I, I think it's it's pretty close. I'm leaning yeah. T1, but I do think that Ash has a much harder time of having a high impact in fights than a Felios. A single blue yeah. ultimate with crit combined with like an, an auto or two can basically single-handedly win a team fight. And I think for Guma, he actually needs to have the space. Did go with damage build, which I'm very happy about, because otherwise I think T1, they don't have the scaling as Pioshik. He might need to just try and kick Zayas away from this one. Doesn't have to use his flash though, as Carrier was looking to make his way in. Shock Blast not going to connect quite as well. And continue on, gentlemen. Yeah, I do think it's close because what I what I see a little bit of is just the fact that T1 doesn't have a true front line. It's just one Sejuani yeah. who's starving gold. Makes them very squishy. So if APA can land any stun, there's a chance he one shots and they actually have a much better front line with summoning court if they play the fights correctly. And I think as well, that's why Karia also going for Radiant Virtue here on the uh, Renata, trying Fair. to build the oh. most angliness. Scatter the Weak trying to come forward here. Summit just by himself, line. finds himself. And Kid the Magnus Storm under three. It's gigantic and Summit's going all out. He's going to get out of the fight as well with Kumiyushi. He's taken down Yon already. Oh. And Core JJ, both of them are going to go golden. And it's T1 that just roll over the top of TL and even Summit will not be allowed to escape as Gumiyushi looking to chase after him. He's got the ward in the brush. And I have a feeling Summit, by going the wrong direction, That's is probably still going and to die. After a 35 minute nail biter with two Barons going over to TL, T1, well they don't get the clean ace because Summit stays alive, but... They were that winning until they game. weren't. Chronicler, and that is going to be the Nexus turrets falling down. Our observers following the story of Summit, but it's the Nexus that needs to be addressed. And T1 are going to take the game, the first game of Swiss. I was going to need a ladder for you, Jad, by the way, to get back up to the analyst desk, I think. That's a great way to start Worlds. Yeah, I'd it actually so. is. It was an amazing game. TL played their wow. hearts out. T1 clutched up when they needed to in that final team fight. And you guys did a great job. Thanks for having me. Oh, Thank thanks you very for coming, much. Jab. We needed you. Glad you were here. And if you thought that after the World's Finals, the nightmares of T1 players were going to be haunted by Pioshik, I know they won, but I guarantee you, I think this is man. I think it's perfect. I think it's absolutely perfect because that has been the stronger of these two junglers so far at this tournament and got the better of Gumi Yusi, or rather, better of Owner uh, at the end of the LCK as well. Now, they'll prioritize the Zaya here over the Alistair, over the Rakan, knowing that on blue side, they'll be able to pick up either whichever is left available here. So look at that power pick. The question is, will Guma now pick up the Kaisa here in return into what has historically been somewhat of a soft counter matchup, that Zaya? Looks like the answer is yes. Yeah, Guma's definitely got a, a pretty nice champion pool in terms of what he could potentially pick here. But I think, you know, just going into a best of one, something consistent, pick up the Kai'Sa. The Zaya has been prioritized just a bit more than the Kai'Sa, and you generally like it in that matchup. But the Kai'Sa going to be the choice here for Guma. I was thinking maybe they go with the Draven or something like that. But not to be the case is Orianna as well as going to be locked in here for Faker. I mean, it's definitely a big pick. It's a big pick. Faker's Oriana coming out here is something, you know, I wasn't sure we were going to get lucky enough to see in this series, but this will, of course, leave Delight the opportunity to pick the Rakan with Zaya. Won't be taking the Alistair here in this first one with the pre-existing synergy between these two champions on the bottom side. One of Delight's best picks even before Alistair came on the scene, even when he was on, Fredit Breon in the past. It was one of his most iconic champions, and he gets to pick it up here. Now, will we see Chovy lock in the Azir here in this first phase. It has been so incredibly impactful in this tournament for engage, for disengage, for trying to get some lane prio. 
Toby, one of the world's best Azir players here. It would be great to see two of Faker's iconic champs as well, Ooh. but they'll prioritize the Rumble. Yeah, that's very surprising. I don't know, Wolf, I, I was with you on this one. I think the Azir, uh, with the amount of prior we've seen and just how strong Chovy is on this pick, maybe you pick it up, but no, it is going to be the Rumble. So that's really interesting going into this next half, as it does look like Carrier is just going to pick up the Alistair here for this lane. We talked about Rakan and Alistair for our Korean support. So Rumble coming on in here, and that Azir immediately, they didn't waste any time to ban that one. Yeah, no surprise there. Doing a little bit of a handshake on the supports. The Rumble's still a bit of the question mark here, and it makes me wonder if we'll see T1 decide to take away a Jarvan here from Peanut because of the existing synergy between those two champions and the Zaya. Jax will be removed here, and the focus is definitely on getting Doran a matchup he wants here in the top side for that Rumble pick. You know, it's just pretty interesting because generally Doran has been kind of the guy that sits back and he's the role player and he, he'll play pretty much anything the team requires him to play. And, uh, you know, they'll try to get that big pick for Chovy or get a very strong jungler or bot lane. But not the case here. They're trying to get him some room as Silas going to be banned away as well. They don't want Chovy to pick that one. Up, Silas, a long time pick for him. And Silas just so incredibly impactful with Alistair on the board. You know, you can always end up taking an early Drake or Rift Herald fight with this pick. Once you get level six, you steal away the Alistair ultimate. It just becomes so difficult to take that Silas down. Orion ultimate also fantastic for Silas. So I do like this choice quite a bit. It'll be a lease in. They actually take away here from Owner. It's one of his best picks historically, hovering over 90%. <laughs> Uh, win rate for most of his career on this pick. <laughs> He's insane. He's insane. He's actually ridiculous on that pick. So I don't mind it. You know, Leeson has kind of been edge. He's been moving his way in uh, here at Worlds. So definitely take away one of owner's best picks. But that does leave the Rel, which has been a big game changer for many of our games so far. And there's such a great amount of synergy as the Jarvan will actually be considered as well as a bit of a takeaway here from Peanut. There's a lot of synergy between Jarvan as well as Rel for the Orianna setup. You put the ball on the Jarvan, he then goes in, you have the follow-up ult, you have Alistair there, and you can set up a lot of pick potential, especially with the Kai'Sa follow-up. So now let's see what is going to be the choice here for Genji. They may just simply take the Rel, which also works for the Equalizer, but Peanut looking for a Viego pickup here to look for more of a front-to-back Focus one target down, transform style. Oh, yeah, what? Kali. <laughs> what, what, what's going on here, Wolf? Okay, this Akali is going to be picked up on the side of Gen G. And you'd have to imagine that goes into the hands of Chovy here. Maybe a, a pocket pick to try to deal with this Oriana we've seen many times. It does become really difficult to try to flex it anywhere else on blue side, as it will be an old favorite, one of Peanut's most played in the LCK here, coming out. And the Kha'Zix can be very dangerous, very bursty, a lot of great farm potential here with this pick, but it's a pick that can go splat, as we often say with Kha'Zix, if you do fall behind against this much CC, this much damage to the Orianna. And now it's gonna be Aatrox that tackles the Rumble, a matchup we saw at the, uh, the lot in the latter half of the LCK summer season here. A matchup Doran very comfortable on both sides of here. We'll see if he ends up taking the Teleport or the Ignite in this matchup, because I think it is going to be very defining. And I imagine <laughs> that we'll see Peanut hovering the top side of the map quite substantially. Absolutely. I am so glad you mentioned the Ignite for the Rumble, because uh, we definitely have a guy over on the LCK show that has had a lot to say about the top Rumble and certain summoner choices. That would be Looney if you guys have watched uh, the LCK. So. Would love to get his thoughts eventually, but it's uh, it's very interesting, you know, like I was saying before, these two LCK teams at best of one, what do you bring out? And I feel like Gen G, they had like a really good standard start and then someone flipped a switch and then they went with all these kind of crazy picks. So I'm very curious to see how it's going to work out. Wolf. Yeah, definitely a curveball here with the Akali into the Orianna, one where he thinks he's going to be able to pick Faker. Faker was caught out a lot by Team Liquid. Akali, a pick that can be very punishing, can be very threatening, especially if the ball is placed elsewhere. You can get around the Orianna and pick her very easily if Faker is playing greedy, especially inside. So I think trying to punish some of the mistakes we did see in that first game from T1. It's definitely going to be really important, whereas on the side of T1, I mean, this is just really standard, right? You got a, a very fantastic front-to-back team fight oriented composition with the Orianna and multiple ball carriers. So we're going to be getting into this game right away for Gen.G versus T1 as the fan chants begin, Wolf. Feels like we're just at home, Valdez. <laughs>
massive crowd here for Korea's two most popular teams and they're both one and one. They both were the successful LCK teams, unlike unfortunately for D plus and KT Roll. So they were dropping down to zero one. They will not be playing in this one O bracket. They're looking for their redemption against each other a little bit later on this evening. But I, I gotta say, you know, this is the expected result. Genji were the favorites in their matchup. T1 were the favorites against Team Liquid. Was a little bit tougher than people expected it to be. Team Liquid definitely gave T1 a run for their money. But in this matchup here, anything goes. We have seen this go both ways so much. And I myself, I think when you look at T1's draft here, it's definitely one that you know is stock standard, you know is very strong. It's very meta. And Genji threw a bit of a curveball here with the Rumble Top, the Iz Ignite that we are going to see here from Doran Peanut once again on this Kha'Zix. And then we'll, of course, see the blue start here. Ward goes down, will not be cleared. Yeah. This is going to be a really fun start to the day, Wolf. We are starting off with Genji and T1 going head to head. Obviously, we had that uh, excruciating draw show, which a lot of people had a lot of things to say about. But I think it's going to be really interesting when we do get to the best of threes afterwards. Um, but yeah, we, we start off with Genji versus T1. Then we go into G2, G2 versus Weibo. And we have so many amazing matchups for today, for the end of the day. It's just going to be a great time, Wolf. It really is. Uh, it's the World Championship in Korea, and we're very lucky to have that happen. And historically, Korea hasn't done as well in the Korean World Championships <laughs> as uh, they have outside of Korea. But we'll see if that changes here this time around as the early game here for the Akali. Going to be a bit of a troublesome one into the Oriana. Of course, both of these junglers pathing towards the top side as we expected, starting red buff and blue buff respectively. We'll see how much pressure Doran can get down early in these early few levels with the Comet he's picked up here and that Ignite. And maybe Peanut can get something done or at least keep the attention away from the mid and bottom lanes. Yeah, absolutely. I, I just want to go back to this Akali pick in the mid lane. Chovy did play it a couple of times in solo queue, and he, he's definitely a guy that will pick up the Akali, the Silas. You know, he was someone who really thrived in that meta. So I'm not really surprised to see Chovy himself picking it. It's just that we haven't really seen the Akali in, in a little bit, but it's just so cool that he's like, okay, we're playing against T1. It's time for my Akali. Had some, uh, well, not, not so great trades, it seems, so far, but... Uh, I'm sure he's going to be confident on this pick, but let's see how Faker can punish this, especially early on against the melee champ that is Akali. Yeah, just going to try to deny some further CS's. Doran. Uh, okay, taking a massive chunk of damage there. Doran getting overheated as well. And we'll just back off of that one. Zayu's getting a nice trade. Yeah, Doran not getting exactly what he wanted there. Now we're going to have a Scuttle Crab attempt here from Owner. Of course, they have tons of mid prio with Faker getting that insane trade early. And of course, Smite Ooh. is there for owner, so <laughs> there's no way Peanut, Peanut could take this one away. And that bid probably already come up big. Delight going to try to come over here and punish, but Faker very wary of this. Yeah, I mean, there's only so much you can do with mid prio if the enemy support is also going to come down into the mid lane, or come up, I should say, as now Karia is here. He's got a combo going as the rest of Gen G is trying to come out and punish this, but it's actually T1 who are now in a 3v2 situation. Peanut has to flash away. Even Goomba's joining the fight, and T1 are going to start this one off with a bang. They get first blood for Faker on the Oriana in that South River. And despite Delight being up here faster, there's just not enough health for Chovy. It's early game, Akali, his impact's going to be low. Faker has enough mana there, and T1 ultimately end up outnumbering them there. They will win the battle for the Scuttle to pick up first blood for Faker as well, who put that pressure on early. And remember, Faker is recovering from a very weak end of the season where he had, of course, an injury, came back, wasn't mechanically looking as strong as he was in the first half of the season, but was still the leadership was showing through. But in this early game here into the Akali, gets the advantage and helps them secure first blood and the double Scuttle. Yeah, now he's got blue buff. He's already completed a lost chapter. It's just going to make this lane even more annoying for Jovi. There's really not much he can do without flash down on CS. You know, this isn't the, the standard Jovi experience, if you will. So it uh, will be important to take a, a quicker uh, or a further look on this lane in the future of this game. But yeah, just trying to deny this bottom scuttle play, but it just goes awry. 
Yeah, it goes awry here. And notice Chovy is sitting at sub half health, and Delight is focused down early. Baker gets away here from Peanut. And this is just a numbers game you are not going to win without pays here. There's nothing you can do. There's just way too much damage output here. And Chovy just useless here at sub half health level four. Not much they can do. Felt definitely a bit forced from the side of Gen G, but let's see if they can turn this one around. They're certainly going to need to do that, as it looks like Zeus is a bit down on the farm in the top side. Doran doing a good job of, uh, you know, just getting some of that early uh, pressure here for the Rumble in this lane. Yeah, Doran, no assist here from Peanut just yet. You can see the CS advantage, though. Definitely, you can feel it. Owner going to come up here. Neither jungler level six just yet. Control ward advantage here, and Peanut's going to back away. Doran needs to be cautious about this, but it looks like he's just going to try to get some information. And they're going to look for a trade here, but it won't connect the chains. Yeah, it's really interesting the timing of when Doran does go for that trade. Like, owner is right here. Of course, Doran doesn't know that exactly. And as I say that, he's going in. He's got Ignite too, but now owner looking to punish this, and the flash is going to miss after the flag and drag. So Doran does get away with his life. Yeah, it will be down a flash here, though. And it's a trade, of course, of flashes, but can be very risky for a squishy champion like Rumble. Gen G going to try to turn this into a bottom side play here. And it looked for a moment like perhaps Doran wasn't aware of this, but wanted to be a little bit of a juicy target here to keep Owner a little bit occupied, try to force him out so they could identify for sure he was up there. They didn't have that control ward. It was T1's control ward there on the top of the river, so they just didn't have 100% of an idea where Owner was. They can draw him out, confirm the dragon. So basically flash trade here plus dragon for Gen G. Yeah, definitely uh, pretty necessary after the way that first play did go for Gen G. So let's see what they can do with this one. As Chovy, you can you can feel the pressure already. Faker not completing the item just yet, but still able to put on an immense amount of pressure and has enjoyed now basically a 15, 14 CS lead just about. And now Owner looking to invade the jungle against the Kha'Zix here. And a little play down on the bottom side of Flash away at the same time. But we got Owner looking for the solo, and he's just going to dunk onto Peanut as Toby also getting into the action, not to be left out, but doesn't amount to too much for him. But Owner, man, he's able to pick up the solo. The timing of this is so perfect for Owner. Is he able to, he's able to get the smite, grab level six, and then has the all-in opportunity, denying Peanut his own level six there. Has a massive advantage here in this early game and will just simply be able to take him out. and. Two kills here to zero. Yes, you got the Drake as Gen G, but this was a huge momentum shift now for T1. Yeah, they're totally in the driver's seat at this moment in time. Peanut, you know, kind of struggling, went in very deep on the river play. Now he's going to get invaded. Very nice timing on this invade from owner. Yeah, exactly what I'm talking about. He identifies, OK, I've got the opportunity to come in here and smite, steal this away, drops the ward in, hits level six, can cataclysm him and take it out. It's about as basic as it gets, but it's the knowledge of the timing that Peanut would be there. They're both level five. He knows he has this window. It's not even that risky here for owner, but he comes up with a big reward. Yeah, now take a look at this. I mean, Peanut, he does hit level six, but he walks over a ward. T1 knows that they are going for this Rift Herald, and it does look like they are uh, looking to sign a lot up to this one, but actually not going to challenge it. So Genji will be able to pick up a Rift Herald pretty much for free on that top side with a big rotation from their bottom lane. Yeah, so two neutral objectives going over to Gen G here, and T1 looked like they were c going to contest, even Guma rotating over, so they won't be able to turn this into a plate trade in the bottom side. Either Pays and Delight are rotating back down there, so T1 coming up a little bit empty there after that kill in the jungle. Chubby being shadowed here by Karia, who is looking for maybe something. We'll see if Faker's Shockwave can find at least Chovy in this game. Maybe more as the game does come along. Chovy is looking for the play now. Perfect timing as Karia is not here. The Shuriken is going to land. But Faker doesn't really seem to care as he's just got that refill bill ticking and he's able to back away. Didn't even have to go into Merc Threads. Just straight up Sork Pen Boots. He is not scared of Chovy at all. Yeah, not worried about Akali, not worried about any sort of tenacity here, just wants the full damage here on this Orianna. It's up being good damage here for Chovy, but no threat really. As Genji grouping around this uh, scuttle, it's two minutes until Dragon spawns. So you're going to get that vision preempted. Bottom side, they do have a lot of control. Spaker is teleporting back mid. Diving this could be risky against an Alistair here. Looks like they're going to think better of it. Yeah, probably not the play at this point in time. You can see the players with the most amount of gold in this one, Faker and Owner, not too surprising as Owner already picking up his Gore Drinker. 
and will be looking to challenge more now that he's completed that first mythic item. And yeah, I mean, just trying to get some of that. Look at that. He blocks the cannon with his body, does not care to just eat a shuriken because he knows that Chovy cannot put on any pressure. He knows Chovy's number one weakness is he needs CS <laughs> more than anything. This is going to really hurt yeah. his mental. Um, But yeah, nice block there. 20 CS up. Currently is Faker, who's maintaining that early game lead. Now, Owner is looking for an opportunity here. Chobi, of course, does have Flash. Looking to fish that one out. Faker drops I mean, the ball. They can dunk on him so hard. The damage is just huge. There it is. Chobi with a very nicely timed Flash to just barely get away from this one. As meanwhile, Pays and Delight have moved up to the top lane as all this is going on. But again, they're going to push Chovy out of the mid lane. Uh, Chovy pushed out, so even though he lives and the reaction time was fantastic, it's ultimately still a huge win for T1 here. Now we're going to see a bit of a lane swap coming through as Guma goes top. Doran going to grab a plate bottom side here, so picking up some additional gold to get this rumble online. But man, T1 with so much control right now, already 1,600 gold, 1,500 gold ahead at this point in time. Only two kills in their pocket, but the lead is massive and the damage is going to start really stacking up. The Jarvan's massively ahead. He can continue to put pressure on this Akali, put pressure on the Rumble. And it's really difficult for Genji to now sail through the mid game when T1 have the perfect mid game composition. They got Orianna, Aatrox, they've got a Jarvan who's online, and it's that lethality Kaisa that's going to be so powerful right now when they don't have a traditional frontliner in this composition. That really worries me here for Genji. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the amount of burst damage for T1 when they are ahead is going to be insane. So it's really just going to be about putting everything together and finding the right targets, right? Because you, you want to make sure you can get someone that's not too slippery that will kind of get out of your grasp and just line up the damage onto them. So we'll have to wait and see how that does develop as it does look like we have this Mountain Drake that might be fighting for here, fought for here. Peanut coming in. From the bottom side, as Genji make a play for this one? Zayas does have teleport. Guma going to have to walk down here, though, to the dragon fight. So they're going to have to delay this if they're going to, in fact, contest. But I mean, Genji have full control of this choke point with a Rakan. This is going to be a tough ask. And T1 to simply relinquish the Drake. I think this is the right choice here. You are down a dragon. You don't know what the soul is going to be. But all of your mid-game advantages aren't going to matter if you can't actually enter the battlefield. Wow. So Genji, nicely played. But T1, I think this is the right call. Yeah, it's I would say it's definitely the safe call, right? I think with their lead, you know, you could try to make a play for it, but instead they're just going to sit back and uh, wait for some of their spikes a little bit later on. And speaking of which, Gumiusi seems to have no idea that this rumble is in the bush, and now he's getting flashed on. Guma will be able to flash away from this one, and there's the ultimate just ticking down, and Doran will pick up the solo onto the Kaisa. Guma left all alone. Yeah, Guma, he's definitely aware there was a possibility, but still strayed too far forward there. Doran hits everything, and it's the Comet as well on top of that equalizer that will finish Guma. Summoner's down now as well on this Kaisa. Huge win here for Doran. Much needed gold here for Gen G. Top side, we'll see if T1 can answer on the, onto the Akali. It doesn't seem likely. Delight is shadowing there, and so Peanut's just going to look to steal blue buff away. Yeah, it's kind of interesting how that one all came together. There have been so many swaps in the lanes, kind of started by Gen G and trying to make plays on the objectives. They had their bot lane in the top side, and it did feel like T1 was trying to catch up to that, and it ended up with this weird matchup of the Guma versus Doran, and that was not one that Guma wanted to go for. So you can see in terms of turret plates has been pretty even so far. So even though T1 did get that early lead, Gen G are sticking in this one. See Guma very aware of the possibility of this, but just needs to go up and catch that wave and doesn't expect Doran popping out with that much damage. The equalizer is well aimed. Comet connects, and that's enough to take Guma out. Huge for the Rumble to pick up that gold and to push Guma off of the map. He's 20 farm behind, pays currently. If so we take a look at the MasterCard lane economy snapshot here, you can see big win for Faker in the mid lane. That much we've known has been true this entire game, but neutral objectives have gone to Gen G. Pays massively far ahead of Guma. In terms of late game scaling, this could be a huge problem for T1 later on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that Zaya is going to be a late game powerhouse. This lethality, Kaisa, you know, obviously has the huge burst damage, but uh, will he be able to find those angles is really the question. And Chovy, definitely pretty far behind, but uh, once this Akali gets, you know, two, three items, still going to be able to blow people up. Um, and we'll just have to wait and see how these fights do go. But props to Gen.G for sticking in this one after some of those early kills. As now, we do have the second Rift Herald, which our LCK teams just love to fight over. They can't resist 
Wolf. They must get it. And of course, they well, just want to get that pressure on the third Drake in the mid game. Genji were able to get that second Drake, you know, without a fight from T1 because they had such great positional advantage. They can't say the same about this Herald here. And again, T1's mid game power is spiking so hard right now. They're only up 700 gold here, but the items they have on the carries they have are just so deadly. They're going to actually take this turret, maybe more. Hayes is just eating the damage. I mean, he just sits on the ball and Faker says, thank you very much. I will eat that one and picks up a second kill for himself. Pays not respecting the damage. I was going to say, I mean, Gen G, they knew where to fight their bot ba bottom side battle on the dragon to get that control and then take that without a fight. They looked like they were going to give up this Herald, but they went for a late contest on the turret. And T1 are going to get more than just that kill on Pays with the turret. They're going to look for their Rift Herald now. Peanut has the opportunity to steal here, potentially. Yeah, you got a Rumble ult coming down, but a little bit half-hearted, perhaps. T1 going to take control, and they know that Peanut was behind them. So Owner going to try to get this fight be started here in the top side of the map, but not going to complete this one. Is Chovy just going to walk away from this? And Zeus is staying around for a very long time. Just gonna walk away, or rather fly away, with those glorious wings. But yeah, T1 gonna pick up yet another objective. Yeah, their first real objective of the game, but critically grabbing that turret, grabbing that kill onto Pace really shifts momentum back into their favor here as Genji was able to get those first few without a real fight as Doran once again <laughs> looking for an opportunity. Wait, this is the same spot. I saw this already, but it was uh, Kaisa. But Faker says, I am different. I can challenge you. And that he will. He's just holding on, waiting for the one second for his shockwave. Doesn't even need it. As Jody gonna come in, dodging the shuriken as Faker, but he's in a lot of trouble. He's alone against three. And now Zeus is on the run to light, trying to continue on this one. Pays running into the rest of T1, but they will just be able to get away by running to their turret. So Gen G only able to pick up Faker on the backside of that one. They'll grab a turret here as well, and Zayas is going to need to back away. Pay's going to take that one out. A lot of money here on this Zaya. And this is setting up nicely, of course, for a Drake fight here in the next 15 seconds. Gen G looking like they want to reset. However, Kerry and Guma trying to stick around here. Of course, will spot Peanut. And it looks like T1 are actually going to get the Drake started first. Delight. I don't think there's any follow-up damage here, but they'll at least keep them away. And I gotta say, Valdez, it looked really good for Genji in that last bottom side fight, but this might be an opportunity for T1 to finally turn these objectives around as they set up first. Yeah, I guess just the chase, not really able to get too much other than Faker and some low health bars. They decide to go for a reset. They have two Drakes already, so T1 just going to be able to pick up their first one as we'll take another look at this one. Pace just not respecting the ball. Faker taking advantage of that. Yeah, it looks like they're on two pages here as Peanut and Chovy are trying to control a little bit more Rift Herald vision, whereas Delight and Pace feel like they can hold onto this turret while outnumbered. Now, this is the really interesting play down here as Doran tries to look like he, it looks like he wants to actually all in onto Faker, but what he really wants is actually to bait Faker forward and they're going to try to win the War of Attrition because they have members much closer here. Lewis Delight is coming down. Peanut is coming down much faster. They bait Faker forward, and even though Zayas matches the teleport here, once again, they're outnumbered. This was a great play by Doran, a nice bait pulling Faker in. Yeah, meanwhile, we got a lot of pressure from Gen G into T1's jungle. They are just going to push T1 out, and in fact, they will get this top tier one turret. Meanwhile, Zayas alone on the bottom side. Take a look at the level difference as well. Uh, just two levels ahead in that top lane, but also take a look at the total damage as Faker he started the game in the lead, and now he is still holding on to the reins of this one. So we are just trading turrets here. It's an LCK classic. Don't fight, just hit those objectives. <laughs> Rift Herald, of course, going to help you win that race, though, as we trade enters. As we might see an attempt to deny this. Oh, boy, Peanut, he's just sitting on it, and Faker is so strong at this point in time. He's nearly got the Shadow Flame finished off, and... Man, I mean, that, that was pretty close. They're just going to back off of that one, and it will be a saved turret. But tier two turret taken down by T1 in the mid lane. That is a huge advantage to them, especially with some of these drakes that will be fought over here in a bit. Shadow Flame completed, as you were alluding to. Fakers just picked that one up here. Baron is spawning in 15 seconds. Now, that might seem like it's not something to talk about right at 20. <laughs> but with the spikes that T1 have hit here, Dustblade done for Guma. Faker has Shadow Flame here. Look at the Aatrox build as well. Dustblade as well as a little bit of MR. I mean, T1 absolutely could look to group contest vision here. They're the ones with the mid tower advantage, so they have a lot of ways to set up for an early Baron. And it's T1, the kings of taking early Baron, something that Genji now have to really put their focal points on.
Yeah, T1 definitely one of the first teams in the LCK, at least, to really put pressure on the objective from ahead. They say, hey, 2,000 gold lead, fine, we can do this. We got some players that can tank it up. We have great turn in our composition. Let's just go for the objective. Now, they're going to hold on that one for now. Looks like they do want to put some pressure on this top tier one as Doran just trying to play safe. He does have some allies nearby. It's really great to see T1 utilize the pressure they have here on top side to threaten the Baron, as well as that turret. They know that Guma can fall back to that mid turret is OK, Faker. Yeah, Faker in a lot of trouble here. Chovy on the chase. It's really difficult to wait, get away from this. Akali he hits the Shuriken as the Shockwave lands, does not care, and owner can't do anything about it. Chovy just going to pick up that kill. Bit of greed here from Faker once again in the side lane. And yes, Zayas is going to force a teleport down here to bottom side, but this is going to open things up massively in terms of Baron control here for Gen G. It's not the first time we've seen Faker caught out here on this pick, and we'll see if Gen G can get much from it. At least going to relieve finally a lot of that pressure on the top side where they were threatening turret, they were threatening controlling that choke point for Baron. You can see how this all starts off here. They see, of course, that Owner is leaving Fakers out here, and Equalizer comes down first. Chovy kind of zones Faker, and then even though the ultimate is going to hit, the Shuriken lands here through the ultimate. Chovy, a masterclass here on this Akali, and Owner can only Cataclysm away. Yeah, like I said before, this guy's been playing Akali, Silas, stuff like this. Like, he is a master of this kind of pick, and he's been playing it recently. Pulls it out on the world stage in competitive, and he has been looking great on it outside of the uh, the early game. But uh, at the end of this one, maybe we won't even remember that happened. We'll have to wait and see how this one does come along, as Chovy certainly has gotten himself at least a seat at the table, I would say, here as this game does draw along to the mid game. Faker utilizing teleport here to try to put that pressure once again on the top side of the map, this time shouted by two members of his team. Oh boy, here we go again. TP is coming in. Faker is just flashing, dodging, getting away from everything. But Zeus now is going to be totally caught here. Has to just run away from this one. Meanwhile, Peanut nearly loses his life to Karia and Guma in the river. And that might just be the call to go for the Baron. I mean, yeah. the jungle of Gen G is just gone. Just gone. No flash here. They're looking for the play instead, but they're not going to catch to light out, especially on that Rakan. I mean, T1 have so much control here, and it's off of trying to bait them in with Faker once again. You know, it's a double-edged sword. Obviously, sometimes Faker's going to get caught. There is no follow-up. This time, T1, once again, all grouped towards top side, make Faker look like a juicy target. Genji come through. Bottom side of the fight is won by T1, and Genji have to back away. They're not confident enough that they can actually go ahead and start the Baron off. They're going to take a reset timer here, but got a lot of ground there off of the play. Faker, of course, down both summoners now, and Genji Rush to Dragon. Yeah, the timing of this is pretty interesting. They know that T1 must have gone for some resets, but T1 barreling into the river. It looks like they do want to challenge this in the bottom side. Delight is a bit caught out, but he is Rakan, and now he's going back in. He's looking for the big engage with that Rumble Ultimate over the top. That's going to be the Kai'Sa just gone in this fight before it even began as Jovi just running down the top side alongside Adoran, and that is a clean ace to the side of Genji. That's Delight's Rakan for you every single time. You think he's not going to be an issue. You think you've got him low. You think he's not going to go back in. He absolutely will. Genji have positional advantage on this fight here. And even though Delight takes a massive amount of damage, he goes for the charm here, gets the knockup, and then the follow-up damage is layered through from Doran. Look at his positioning. Rumble under no threat whatsoever. Faker not in position to follow up. And Delight, yeah, he will die. But he does the heavy lifting here to set up the damage dealers to actually get the work done. And Genji will follow up with a Baron as well. And suddenly, Genji with a massive nearly 3,000 gold lead here, soul point advantage, advantage, and Baron buff on top of it all. Yeah, I feel like if there was one thing to really look out from the pick ban, it wasn't even, <laughs> it wasn't even, you know, the strange picks coming out or the less likely picks. It was just the fact that Delight got Rakan, as we do have this team fight damage powered by AWS. You can see just what they were able to get done. And T1 was able to fight back just a bit, but it was just that turnaround from Delight. I just can't believe they didn't... Not only did he get Rakan, but also they have Zyra Rakan here. And now with this Red Bull Baron power play, they should be able to roll over from here. Let's see how much Genji can get done 
with this buff. Yeah, and, and there were other questions about that fight as well. Faker not in position to follow up or catch any of those damage dealers. He was really under threat, and controlling the choke point is so relevant in these fights. They just did not have it. Now, they will grab this turret here against Gen.G during this Red, Bu uh, Red Bull Baron power play. But take a look at the win probability here, powered by w uh, AWS. It was mostly T1 for a majority of this game, but after that critical play on the Dragon, massively goes over to Gen.G. Yeah, you can see Genji had some little spikes there where they were fighting back, you know, perhaps when Chovy was picking up kills and stuff like that. But this one might just be the straw that broke the camel's back. Let's see what they can get done with this as some push in the bottom side as well as mid, but nothing really brewing in terms of a big push from the side of Genji. So they do have this Baron, but taking their time with it for now. Yeah, a lot of turrets already removed from the map, so looking now to push this inner down in mid. Chovy pushing the top inner as well. That's going to push that power play much higher here, as you can see, trying to get all three inners. They're set up for it. Akali in the side. They could grab this one, then rotate over. They still have a whole minute left on this Baron, and there's just not much T1 can do here. They have decent wave clear, obviously, with this Orianna. So they're just going to have to sit back and lose their turrets here. And Gen.G going to use this extra prio here to probably set up vision around the bottom side of the map here for what is going to be the Cloud Soul fight. And we talked about the power of the mid game here, but Gen.G didn't really take that many important big 5v5 fights when T1 spiked at their hardest. They avoided those fights, took objective control rather than trying to force picks. And yes, T1 got a pick here, got a pick there. Faker got massively ahead. He was the number one damage in the game. But he won't be able to match the pick potential here of this Akali necessarily now. It's the scaling power of this Zaya as well. Look at the gold difference over time here. Pretty massive difference. Yeah, uh, was in favor of T1, but now Gen G, one big play, turns this entire game around. And yeah, I, I just haven't really seen T1 try to put together, you know, one of these, you put the ball on the Jarvan, he goes in for an engage, you're trying to get uh, some flashes out of the Zaya, or at least a Featherstorm, something like that. They haven't really been able to put together a big 5v5 team fight in their favor in that fashion. So Gen G, a bit more scrappy, utilizing that Rakan to get that huge engage. And now they're trying to put the nail in the coffin on this one. Let's see how this fight does go as Pino trying to get away, does get knocked up, doesn't seem to care too much. Just going to run away from that one and uh, hold his own. He knows he's got Delight nearby. Not even going to use the Blast Cone. We'll just get out of here. And they will, I believe, finally get that last inner there on the top side. Yes. So. Even though the Baron is over, they do secure all three enters from this. And the way Gen G have played around this advantage, turning it into deep vision, turning it into those turrets, means it's very difficult for plays like you mentioned to try to put a ball on Jarvan, toss the Orianna ult in on top of a big play becomes so difficult when you can't see where these huge threats are. We were talking about an Umbral Glaive as well on this Kha'Zix, so Peanut can clear vision very quickly. He's a big threat. If Faker tries to walk forward and set something up, he might get blown up by Peanut. He might get blown up by Anakali he can't see. The <laughs> lack of vision becomes so difficult to play out here for T1. We talked about this a little bit in the draft, but now that Genji have so much control over the map, it becomes almost unplayable here now for T1. Yeah, a lot of uh, assassin type, very slippery, that can really get in uh, to T1's backline without them really even noticing. So now, trying to fight for this Cloud Soul here is Genji. I think they're making a, a big stance saying, okay, this should be ours. Look at the vision right now. There is the one control word for T1 on the right. That's about it. Uh, they don't have anything else in the river or behind Gen G. There's not going to be a big flank from Aatrox unless Zeus really goes the long way around. But even that bottom lane is pushed up for Gen G. This is very well set up for them to just take the Cloud Soul, and that they will. They're just going to take down the objective, and in the front is Owner. He's just going to get ripped to shreds immediately. Gooba doesn't even get to do damage in this fight. And Zeus on the run as well, taking a punch in goes Guma, trying to do something. But at this point, it just looks like Gen G are in total control of this game and Faker just gonna walk away with just his life the rest of his team is gone the rest of his team is gone and this game I think likely gone with it and once again same MO from Genji control the choke point kite back to Baron put Delight in the front he looks like a squishy target maybe you could push push onto this Rakan but Delight will turn on you on a dime and they just cannot close the distance owner tries ultimately without Faker's help but like I was saying before everything needs to work together with T1 and if there's no vision if there's no choke point control you just cannot do it against Genji Oh boy, Faker trying his best, but I think Gen.G have their sights on the Nexus as a massive equalizer over the top. Just the cherry on top as Gen.G dominate from about seven minutes onwards to take down this best of one against T1. And they will move on to two and zero 
and take this big victory. Tough early game, but they controlled the objectives. They avoided the mid game of T1. They didn't take any 5v5 fights until they got control, until Delight made that super play on the Dragon. That's when everything changed. It's becoming a bit of a sore spot here for T1 as we will bump fists here after the game. T1 fans were super unhappy about the draw last night. They didn't want to face Chen Ji this early in Swiss. They had to. They lost to Chen Ji in the last three finals, and Chen Ji once again gets the better of the matchup. Yeah, not too surprising, I would say. They take the Kalista first here and break tradition from what we've seen from them so far. If it is going to be the Orianna, they'll actually go to Guma Zaya. Now, this pick has such an insane win rate yeah. at this tournament, and it has been the best teams that are prioritizing it the highest, and it's one of Guma's best as well. Yeah, it, Zaya itself is 11-2 at the World Championship. It's the most wins that any champion has won in the main stage thus far. And it was also Guma's most played in summer. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to touch on that. Guma is so strong on this pick. I'm glad that at least they take the Rakan away because we saw a little bit of Zaya Rakan getting through yesterday. Weren't too happy about that on our side. But uh, C9 is going to take that one away. They also take away Faker's Oriana, which is the only thing he has played so far. But I do have to say that first pick, Zaya, still very valuable here for the side of T1. Now, Faker has gone back to Nico a lot in these types of scenarios where his priority pick is gone, the Azir is taken away. And I think he might actually save counter pick for the later part of this, but it will be the Rumble they pick up here for Zayas first. So already two top tier picks going over the side of T1. We'll see if they want to grab an Alistair here as well. Doesn't show a whole lot. It's a top tier support pick, one that Karia is very good at. And I think that if you want to hide Faker's pick for now and see if C9 are interested in going deeper down that rabbit hole, the Alistair's one of the safest picks you could grab here right now. Yeah, it looks like they're actually going to keep support and mid to basically pinch C9's ability to ban out a specific role. But kind of just straight up power picks for T1 so far. Jarvan Rumble synergy is going to be really high. Rumble's a champion that hasn't made it through all that much. It's been banned 12 times so far in the main stage, the fourth most banned of all champions. But I mean, there's a chance we just go through this entire draft. Zero Kalista. So even though it was the most banned champion thus far, it'll go unpicked, unbanned this draft. Yeah. Now, Zeri going to come through here for Berserker as the 80 carry pick. So Zeri Rakan, very strong in the late game. You have so much setup for the Zeri. And even though you don't have a front line in this draft just yet, there's a lot of strong picks you can utilize, like Cassante, that will give you that front line. We'll see if T1 want to take that away. You also have a pseudo front line and that Rakan can hold choke points. You have Orianna to hold choke points. You can buy a lot of space for Zeri in a composition like this. Let's see if T1 want to keep the focus on that Cassante. The answer is yes. Asante has been all over the rift, as we have seen so far at uh, the world stage. The Nautilus against the Zeri taken off the board here. What is going to be this last ban for the side of C9? Could just be the Alistair, you know, I was talking yeah. about a lot here. It just seems like a really safe choice. You can pinch that support pool because Faker is a bit of an unknown here in this draft, but you know what the top tier support picks are for sure. And right. it's a no brainer here. I think especially since Berserker will be so critical to any C9 win. Just trying to make the T1 bottom lane as weak as possible via support bans is actually more important than trying to throw random bans at Faker. Yeah, I think it's pretty interesting that T1 left, you know, Karia and potentially Faker here as the last picks because these are the two guys that have the biggest champion oceans on the side yeah. of T1. So I think it gives you a lot of flexibility to just say, let's see what C9 are going to pick, and then we can decide what we want to do next. I do wonder if Faker wants to play Nico to try to set up for Rumble and Jarvan combos here because it's left available, or if he'd rather go for something like a LeBlanc here. Strangely enough, it's not as popular these days, but it's a pick he's very well known for and one that would allow him to side lane pretty efficiently, put some pressure on the Orianna later on, come in at side angles to threaten Zeri. It's definitely a pick that I think is pretty niche, but one he could pull out here. Uh, it's going to be Barry for Karia. <laughs> well, what do we have here? Wow. Karia pulling out the first Bard of the tournament, and the Silas going to be taken here as well. Definitely some decent ultimates on the opposite side. We've been seeing yeah. Chovy pick this up as well. The Silas pretty interesting, I'd say. Honestly, I've definitely seen better Silas ultimates. Nothing here screams to me, great yeah. Silas pick. There's no Maokai or Alistair on the other side that would be super powerful. It's more of that Faker just wants this for the general theme of their team composition. 
And then the Velveth coming in for Blabber as well. That's a, it's actually a departure from what Blabber's played for most of the Summer Split. Summer Split was a lot of Maokai Sejuani duty. So a totally different look here for C9's jungler as far as what he's been playing recently. There's a lot of pushing power with Jax and the Belveth, of course. If you end up getting a lead or if you drop Rift Herald topside, if you win that early Rift Herald fight, there is so much you can gain from that. Pretty tough to win that fight, of course, against Silas in that first battle of ultimate. Silas will be able to match the Orianna ultimate. You have to deal with Equalizer. But I think if C9 can actually win the first Herald, drop it topside, they can get Jax pretty ahead. And then he's going to have an opportunity to be a big side lane threat later on to buy time for Zeri to be that late game carry. The composition here, I feel, for C9 is pretty vanilla, although Zeri's not as common, Bell Beth a little bit rarer. You know what this comp is set out to do. For T1, I think the execution a lot more complex on how they're going to utilize this Bard pick. Yeah, so uh, 423 career games of record for Blabber. This is his second Velvet. So not the most common pick for him. <laughs> I'd be curious about the uh, the bard numbers as well, because I know that Carrier has played it before, and it can work in terms of setting up some of the Wombo combo that they do have. But uh, yeah, the Belveth coming in, I, I think it definitely does have power. It can be a little bit Feast or Famine, but uh, we have seen a Feast a bit here at Worlds when we have seen it. So I think that C9 trying to bring in some pocket picks, trying to bring in some interesting stuff uh, to potentially take down T1. Got an answer for you on the bard. Seven and one. So that's seven more wins than Blabber has on uh, Belveth. <laughs> and it's of almost 550 games for Carrier's career. That's quite a lot of games. And guys, we're ready to jump into the first game of the day. I think that tells you who the crowd is siding with for this one. Huh, shocker. I, I didn't hear a C9 cheer, Weird. strangely enough. Where, um, where are we? Well, hey. They <laughs> They've got <laughs> Korean players on the roster, all right? True, it's, true, true. Sometimes when you have T1 versus Gen G or T1 versus KT, you, you feel like only T1 was there. This is by far the most popular team in Korea. They drown out a lot of fan chants. And uh, we yeah. do have this early aggression here by T1 at level one. Ultimately won't end up being too impactful. No war drop tier either. Yeah, Silas Bard, very strong, level one. So maybe just want to see if they can catch someone out a little bit off guard, but uh, just going to be returning to the lanes. And we'll just have to wait and see what does happen. In this bottom lane matchup especially, I think, you know, we were talking about how Berserker, very key, very um, big carry aspect of the C9 roster, whereas Gumi used to getting a big comfort pick with the first pick, Zaya. Definitely going to have my eyes on that bottom lane. And early on, I'm really curious how well T1 is going to be able to push these lanes because the rumble up top definitely gets pushed. I think Zaya Bard is likely going to be getting pushed early, although I can see that being contested. So it's this mid lane where you would think Orianna can get shove early in the lane just because it's ranged versus melee, but then that's also going to be owner's first look for where he's going to be ganking because the way T1, I feel like, has tried to default their play style is a little bit back to how they were winning about a year ago where they just try and push every lane, play super aggressive. So I think that's what T1's going to be going for this game. And MNS needs to make sure he has really good wards. And he needs to push as well so that there's not three lanes getting pushed in, which would stop Blabber from having any river access. Yeah, looking to try to use the moments when Faker is clearing to actually get some damage in with his Q as he did there, trying to keep the health slightly to his advantage, to use the range advantage there as best as he can to get one of those wards up. A Blabber will be seen, speaking of wards here, by this one as he does come down towards owner's uh, portion of the jungle. And this early game here, obviously, for Rumble and Jax can go either way. The Rumble has a lot of advantages there. Zayas did take Comet and the Ignite. So he is going to have some ability to put some real pressure on in these first few levels. Yeah, and very early on, I actually think this is advantage T1 because what Blabber did there as Fudge is trying to sneak uh. in behind the turret of Zayus, that's not normally how Rumble lanes go unless I uh, haven't been studying top lane most recently. We have seen a few times that Jax will try to go at level 3, level 4, like right on the cusp of that and actually proxy that wave so they can avoid the harassment, but he kind of failed it there and will wow. take a bit, bit of damage. Meanwhile... Uh-oh, they just line up for it. That's a lot of poke damage. Got to be careful about that. We've been seeing a lot of summoners burned early in the bottom lane of this world so far. Yeah, so I think good start by Fudge in the top lane. He'll be able to get a recall off there. The problem for Blabber is he's not going to get access to this bottom scuttle crab most likely because the Zaya Bard is already there early. It will depend, though, MNS's condition is very good, uh, so there could be. A, I mean, Blabber being able to get this because of MNS's condition is very strong. Uh, this is going to be huge here. We'll be able to pick this one up. You see the push in mid also going to be able to help as MNS 
could come down and assist. Carrier looking for uh, the journey. Nice juke. Yeah, not going to hit that one. Berserker just keeping his cool. Very important to do that, especially with both the supports on the roam. Got to be careful. Yeah, and that magical journey is going to be very useful for setting up flanks for the Silas later on, setting up flanks for Jarvan later on. It does work very well with this composition. The ultimate as well can really put a damper on Jax trying to flank, depending on how Karyo wants to utilize it. As, as you mentioned, Fudge will be able to come back to lane with that proxy without burning his teleport. Feels very nice to do. Yeah, and I, I think MNS, whether or not he's able to hold on to his flash, is going to be so critical this entire game. Nice steal there by Owner, recovering from the earlier crab. But basically, you can see Fudge, Blabbers, Ven, Berserker, they have all ways to escape a Jarvan or Bard ultimate. MNS really doesn't. So if he ever is without Flash, they're going to very easily be able to kill him. Owner beginning to bully a bit here in the enemy jungle. He's just going straight at Blabber. He's got the push in the top side. Oh. Blabber uh -oh. is not going to hit that uh -oh. one. He's taking damage from the little Krugs here, and he nearly loses his life, but he is going to flash out of this one as now here comes Carry a flash forward, extremely aggressive. And once again, Berserker just going to kind of laugh at him. And they're just putting pressure on in top side and bottom side here in the 2v2 once again. Carrier using the journey to put that pressure on does uh, commit the flash this time around. Doesn't find a ton of success, but they are really just trying to tax C9 everywhere. Knowing Blabber was topside, knowing he was pushed out there, he's forced to flash and budge. Now level 6 is up. Uh -oh. oh, he's taken way too much damage from that equalizer already. He's going to go straight into the death chamber. First blood given over to Owner in the top lane. I mean, that was just perfectly done. That play was about 45 seconds in the making as well. Well, Jarvan invading Blabber's jungle, pushing him down. Also, Zeus maximizing his experience to hit six at the right time. Very, very hard for C9 to counter that. Big play for T1. Yeah, he's going to be able to pick up his Sork shoes as well off of this play. And yeah, he doesn't have teleport, but the wave is fine. He's going to be able to get back to lane without really any cost here. Fudge at least was able to, you know, proxy that wave and return to lane on that first back without using his, so he can get back to lane right away. But that's a massive amount of gold going into a Rumble's pocket early on. Yeah, it's a pretty good start for T1. <laughs> yeah, feels pretty good for them. I'm sorry, Jet. So far. <laughs> it's not great. Well, we'll, we'll see how this game develops. Uh, you know, T1 did struggle a bit against TL early, but he's got the shockwave and he's looking to get the flash, and that he will. MNS just going to get out of dodge. That's all Faker needed to do. He didn't have to burn any summoner spells in order to get the flash of MNS. So now when Jarvan hits level six, he can just move in and alt MNS if MNS ever moves past the halfway point. So not only do they get the top kill, they get the mid summoner spell flash that they needed, which lets them move to this Drake pretty yeah. uncontested. Well, I was, was going to say, I mean, you use that at that timing to grab flash, then, you know, this is before six, but owner can use his flag and drag to threaten that with Faker stealing the shockwave. And now you've grabbed dragon control, and I mean, this is just T1's map to rule right now. All right, Berserker trying to take an aggressive trade here. He's level five against Goomba's level five. Does have some help from Blabber, who was shadowing them down on the bottom side of the map, but not going to amount to too much. Skuma just walks away from this one as double control ward. It's going to be some free gold over to C9, I suppose. Take yeah. their time killing those. I Just a quick reminder on what's at stake here as well. Both these teams are one and one in the Swiss stage. A win won't advance them, a lose won't eliminate them, but it will put them into either an elimination game or a promotion game. So 2-1 is obviously way better because then that means you'll get two chances to play best of threes, where if you win one, you'll advance. Loser goes into the 1-2 pool and will be on the brink of elimination. And there are some top teams down there uh, as well. There will be after today. And Karia here, a little bit overextended, just gonna grab some Spell Thief's edge stacks and they're not gonna commit anything towards him despite his oh flash boy. still being down. His owner's not done yet with this harassment here on the top side. He's got level six. Yeah, this time it's even more powerful. He has the push in the top side again. The ult blown down on the bottom lane. Those men going on in as Karia just trying to walk this one out. But the Zeri ultimate just gonna push T1's bottom lane back as they will not take that fight at this point in time. Yeah, C9 doing their best to try and make something happen. That top side is just getting absolutely steamrolled, though, by T1. Really rough start for Blabber. You really would love to be able to get that first Rift Herald as the Belveth, but he is just behind in experience since that early invade by owners, since the Rumble has been able to push top and is really struggling to get the farm you need to take over the game as Belvin. Yeah, the, the no magic mantle that Fudge has right now is it going to be doing too much at this stage, obviously with the Sork Shoes already oh, online. And, you know, if you lose this Herald as C9, you're not going to be able to get Jax accelerated for the mid game. It's just not going to happen. Belveth, as we were talking about in the draft, would love to have that power, get Jax some additional plates. But as it is right now, he just doesn't have any agency here on the top lane. Now, they did stop the Herald take here. They, they are did. grouping for this. 
This is going to be really interesting because Sven left a while ago, leaving Berserker down bot lane for a long time. It's allowed Karia to push the wave, recall, and now be on the way to Rift Herald, which wouldn't give C9 time to kill it. 2v2 at the top side. The Equalizer getting some big value, and now Owner is going to join up with this one as they do want to extend this play, but not sure if they want to overextend as Sven has come on in. And the Flag and Drag goes in up to the Recon. His Owner just doesn't give a damn. He has Karia behind him, gets him in the death chamber. Oh. The oh, man. comes out and everybody is going down on the side of C9 in the top lane. T1 just burning them to a crisp in the top lane. Well, that will be four kills for T1 now in this early game. An over 2,500 gold lead. And it was off the play there. Owner's top side. He saves Cataclysm so long there to make sure he can get the most value out of it. Then Karia gets the double ultimate there to lock two oh, in Guma. place. And Guma. He's gonna force the flash, has to use his ult, but that's still gonna be a win. You'll always trade your ult for that flash there. Absolutely, but now you're looking at a rumble with five Dark Seal stacks. This, of course, does give the Herald yep. over as well. What a dream start for T1, playing around Zeus's rumble. For all the games that Faker missed in the summer split, even though they didn't win that many, when they did, it was often off the back of Zeus, and he's been so dominant in that top lane right here. Even though the ultimate was used early, it gets them low enough that gives... And I feel like C9 had a little bit of confidence here. I don't exactly know why. Well, because... I mean, the problem, too, is that he can flag and drag away from the Counter-Strike here, and Fudge is then forced way too far up, and you've taken so much damage already as Fudge here, you can't stick around in the fight for any extended period of time. It's not like you have any sustained damage yeah. in your members, whereas Zayus has all the sustained damage you could ever want in a skirmish like this. As long as he's at full health and he's untouched, you lose those. Oh, boy, here we go again. I feel like Kerry is just kind of playing with his food at this point. Berserker has dealt with this many a time, but now he doesn't have Flash, so gotta be careful about that. But yeah, Karia gets up to the top side. I think they thought it was a 3v2 for a while, and maybe they could just isolate Owner, but it was just not meant to be. Yeah. And now T1 have really turned the scales in their favor. Over uh, 3,000 gold in the yeah. lead already. Yeah, I, I kind of feel like C9 was stuck between a couple of bad choices. Either they just reset and let the Rift Herald go over, in which case they're already down in gold, they're getting bled out, Belveth falls further behind, or go for a low percentage play, which has bigger drawbacks if it doesn't work. And unfortunately for them, it did not work. The second dragon is spawning. T1 also has control of the river. So C9 is absolutely on the back foot, and T1 is, I feel like, in their comfort zone. This is what they live for. Big gold lead, able yeah. to engage any fight they want, and they're doing it. Absolutely. Well, of course, this is still the feature matchup presented by Mercedes-Benz, Gumi Yusi versus Berserker. And there has been a lot of action in the bottom lane. We'll have to wait and see how those 280 carries do scale up and who is going to get the better of this game by the end of it. As the top lane I have talks a, a lot about it. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, we did see, of yeah. course, that win probability powered by AWS earlier. And uh, I think your guess is as good as theirs at this point in time. It looked very heavily favored even 12 minutes into this game. And that bottom matchup has been, it's its currently deathless for both AD carries, but Carrier put all the pressure on, Guma forced that flash out earlier, he still doesn't yeah. have it, and now he can't really defend this turret without help, and Belbeth is in the main base, so Blabber can't help out, and this is just straight up T1 grabbing plates here, essentially for free, and they may not even need to commit the Herald here, might just want to drop it somewhere else, and that yeah. looks like that's what they're going to do. I think pretty easy to drop at mid lane as well, get a little bit of extra gold on a Faker. He's the only person on the team who isn't currently ahead. That's also the one lane that wasn't naturally winning early, so wouldn't shock me if they just use this bot pressure, push people back in the river and look for a fight or drop the Herald mid. While they're over the wall, they're looking for Sven as he is going to get dunked on, and he's got one hope, his ultimate ability, but that's not gonna do enough as he was alone. One before, as T1 come over the wall, you know, not playing against a lot of bards, I would imagine, but that ability to just attack you in your own jungle, very difficult to deal with. Yeah, I mean, you already don't have a lot of vision, you're already having to pre-plan around a lot, and then that happens. Isaiah's actually getting a little bit caught here. Isaiah's just gonna walk it out. I mean, he's still up a level, as the ultimate committed to there by Fudge, and you talked about the Rift Herald, it is going to be dropped in mid lane, yeah. and this might just be a full turret, I mean, C9. Not really in a position to defend this as finally some people are coming over. Owner is just going for a little <laughs> little walk behind the turret just for fun. I mean, I don't even know what he's doing. He doesn't seem to care. Uh, showboating, maybe. 
I can't really think of any other reason to do that than to have a little bit of fun because they know they're up 4,000 gold. I feel like they're really in their comfort zone right now. Uh, he had the portal there, wasn't able to take it to get back over the wall, but took the long way around. Perhaps afraid Blabber was coming down faster than he expected, but ultimately doesn't matter. But this is what you were talking about in terms of the engage range here. Look at this, getting Faker into position to help lock Sven down. Yeah, he gets away from the Everfrost, tries to hold out, but the Cataclysm is going to keep him in place, yeah. so he's just simply dead. No way out of that one. And that's what you're dealing with with Bard is just putting these melee engaged champions into range of slippery champions like Zeri, of slippery champions like Rakan. They feel fairly safe even without vision when you know generally where people are, but they can go through walls. Looks well, about right. MasterCard lane economy snapshot. It is, uh, well, Faker's only up 31 gold. The rest of the map very heavily favored on the top side, plus the plates you would imagine down on the bottom side that give uh, Guma and Karia their lead down there. Yeah, I, I think even even at this state in the game, there's an extremely low chance that C9 loses. And the, currently, the disappointing thing about this game for C9 is all the plays that C9 may have been dodging in the early game, like Karia flying over the wall and throwing cues at Berserker and Berserker juking them. There was never like a counter play that C9 would be able to make. Uh oh, Fudge in a lot of, of trouble. He flashes onto the other side of the equalizer. Zeus just tanking this one up. Fudge is still alive underneath this turn. He's just going to get flagged from the heavens as owner. Going to pick up his fourth kill in this game. And here's another example. They spent so long on that dive top. So there's three people for C9 bottom trying to make the counter happen. Let's see if C9 can at least get a turret. I mean, they're going to try to here. Karia does have ult. This is going to be very difficult to pull off. And Faker, of course, can hijack something as well. Can grab the shockwave here and try to defend with it. I don't think they're going to be able to get much. Meanwhile, Berserker can't defend this turret by himself. This is a cannon wave. So get the top side play to be a success. Unfortunately, Fudge's flash not good enough to get away from that Cataclysm and the Equalizer. He's impaled by the flag. They lose top turret. Mid turret's down. They find nothing bottom side. 15 minutes and 45 seconds in. Those bounties are up, objective bounties are up, but there is just nothing to take on this rift. And I mean, we are on pace. I'm not saying it's gonna happen, but we are on pace for a perfect game here, potentially for T1. Yeah, I mean, Wolf, you've been here for the summer split struggles of T1. I, I have, yes. Right? The, the MSI disappointment, Faker's wrist injury, falling to, what was it, seven and seven? Yeah. And then Faker coming back and kind of scraping the team through playoffs. Where would you put how they look in this game? compared I mean, to how they looked in the summer split. They look very coordinated, and the thing that, that happened when Faker was gone was not that Poby, his replacement, was so weak comparatively they couldn't play the game. It was really just about the lack of shot calling, and they had a clear game plan to play around Zayas this game, put the pressure on bottom side at the same time. And Faker, if he had fallen further behind in lane, if MNS had actually been able to find some success there, maybe there would have been a pressure point for Blabber, but it feels like Owner yeah. is just one step ahead of Blabber this entire time. Yeah. I think Faker coming in as a leader, that's always been his role in recent years, right? We've all know the yep. Faker moments. We've all seen the LeBlanc plays. We've all seen the Zed versus Zed. But in recent years, he has kind of been that big voice. And yeah. you could clearly feel the preparation going into this series is much stronger than we saw at the latter part of summer season without him. Yeah, I feel like the going through world's history, you know, things Faker does. 2013, always these amazing mechanical outplays. Things Faker does has changed a lot in the last 11 years. Now the thing Faker does is get a bunch of really mechanically talented players around him, hold his own in mid lane, and press his F keys really good and talk. He's been pressing his keys pretty well. Owner, once again, I, maybe it's showboating, I'm not sure. Owner in a little bit of trouble as he does have some help from his squad, but he is going to be able to get away. Blabber gets hooked by the feathers, and now there's a massive equalizer on the entirety of C1, just trying to, C9 rather, trying to retreat out of this one. That's a huge play comes out from Karia, oh. and they turn this one around, and even the tower can't get into this one, as Karia will disable that. This might just be a clean ace going into the hands of T1, and that it is. Nobody will fall on the side of T1. An insane win here for T1, but we all saw it coming. They had control over the dragon, and at this point in time, owner is just so tanky, he could absorb a lot of that damage. And as the turn begins, it feels almost tool-assisted the way that T1 chased the fight. <laughs> and the, the way the equalizer is, is set up by Zayas, watch this play again, as owner takes all of the aggression here as they kite back through, missed 
extendo beam here from Berserker. Look at the equalizer positioning as it goes through this brush. It is just so clean, and no one on C9 can avoid this equalizer damage yeah. except Sven. He's only get over the wall. You can't flash out. You're on a fat wall, and now you're trapped between this this wall here and Carrius re-engage. Oh. He goes through with the magical turn. He sets up the stun, disables the turret so they can further deep dive here, and you are just not gonna get out if you are Cloud9. You are just trapped between a rock and a hard place. One oh of our famous boy. LCK lines. <laughs> All right, so it's, it's only 9,000 gold at 18 minutes. This is definitely... For now. This is one of the most lopsided games we have seen all Swiss stage. And we've we've seen some big ones, too. Yeah, we have. We've had a That's couple a of 24-minute uh, games as well. And, uh, you know, Wolf was talking about it before. We're on pace for a perfect game. That's just going to be Berserker dead for free. There's just no help under the turret. He has flash, but no time to react. And T1 are just taking whatever they want on this map right now. Yeah, certainly looking very much like this game is not going much longer. I mean, we're talking about it's Chemtech Soul. That's a, that's one thing you put in the positives column. It's not like they're getting Hextech Soul on this next dragon here. But the map is completely open. This Herald is going to take out the inner. Will likely get a charge here on that inhibitor turret if they want to commit to it. They don't even have to. And T1 have control over every zone on the map. Look at the wards they have to the top side of the jungle as well towards a Baron that will be spawning in 10 seconds. You've yep. got to clear all of that as C9 before you can even think about the contest. It's quite clinical what T1 has been able to do this game. Good timing on the first three Drakes. Really good timing on this last reset as well so that they can move towards Baron on spawn. That's a T1 classic. I mean, they do flip a lot of Barons. They, they actually move towards Baron on spawn, even if they're not up 11,000 gold. <laughs> it's true. Uh, but this time, they are. And Faker, I mean, he's on three, four, five people Just down to the, the bottom side of the map. And yes, they will get this objective Woo! bounty. Not a perfect game, chat. <laughs> not a perfect game, but it's a perfect Baron. Nobody is going to contest them on that one. As we saw the win probability once again powered by AWS, it looked like 100% actually this time. There wasn't even like a little blip. Yeah, that's time. about right. This would be a higher win probability than G2's comeback on day two when they were at a 99.4% chance of losing. Yeah, I think we might this be would, adding 50, be higher. 50 gold for the Nexus on this uh, Red Bull power, <laughs> Red Bull um, <laughs> Baron power play if they, they wanted to push it further. But just to be safe, they will of course sync up the waves. They're gonna put Faker in the bottom lane here and Blabber. Hey, he got the blue buff. Yeah. You uh, know what? At what cost, That's pretty, that's pretty good, he got the buff. Oh no, he's in a lot of trouble. Yeah, he's, he's being chased down here by owner. I think that carry is just gonna let him do the 1v1 thing and there he goes, dunks into the ground. I say this a lot, but it's hard to criticize teams that are in positions like this, 13,000 gold behind. I mean, you could say there's no way he has any right to that blue buff, but if you just sit in your base, what are you doing at this point? I mean, T1 have won this game, and yep. everything that happens from now on, and frankly, everything that happened from five minutes ago on, is really hard to criticize for, for C9. There really is no correct play. Uh, now Faker is just doing a dance in the enemy base at this point in time. Picks up the quickness and uh, just kind of shoves it in their face as T1. You know, they're on pace to try to break one of the fastest games that we have had here in the Swiss stage. The turrets of the Nexus are already going down. C9, they're going to have to make one last stand and they get the knock up here on Azeus who loses a total of zero health at this point in time as the Bard ultimate comes out as well. And Carry is having a lot of fun at this point. Fudge is in that back line, but he's just going to be ripped to shreds by the Feathers once again. As C1 will play with their food, they will get what they deserve after this victory. As down will go the Nexus, T1 will move on to 2-1 and one in the Swiss stage. Really dominant showing by T1. This is the team that T1 fans wanted to have show up at the World Championship and moves into two and one. Unfortunately, both those wins were against North American seeds, but that's what happens at the World Championship. You have to be able to beat LCK and LPL teams if you want to be moving on. So C9 going to have to just take that one on the chin and come back stronger next time. Yeah, I think the difference in owners play in this game and some of the other games you've seen in the world, you could definitely feel it. I think owners been one of the most heavily criticized T1 players in worlds thus far, despite, you know, only being one and one. And yet he showed up in a big way. One, two, they're at three wins. Uh, they're looking to make it four and qualify for the quarterfinals. We're straight into draft. Azir Renata taken away from the side of PLG with Rakan and Maokai on the side of T1.
I do wonder if this Senna will actually be looked to ban away or if the Zaya will still make its way through the draft. I wonder how different things are going to look with T1 on the red side, too, compared to what we saw in the previous game. How is that going to switch things up? What is BLG going to have? The Rumble banned away as the final one here in the first half, so the Senna's still around. Yeah, Senna's still available. I do like some of the changes that have occurred here with BLG on the blue side, though, in trying to attack T1. They take away the Azir themselves, and Nico was already self-banned by T1, and those two champions were really at the crux of the resurgence of this team. Does mean they're going to give up the Zaya so sought after in the bottom lane, but um, the, the duo combo here of the Orianna Jarvan for T1 that is some nice, sweet engage. The Renata ban is still a bit of weird to me. Like, they, they put such a high priority on it, they really don't want Curry to get his hands on it. Yeah. I mean, they still ended up getting super pushed in, in bottom lane because of the, the, yeah. the Senna Tom Kench. But uh, I think that's what they're trying to avoid. You know, a lot of those, oh. like, Kalista is available, so you don't want the Renata plus Kalista. You don't want, the, like, the Renata plus Draven lanes. They're locking the Syndra now. They did have the Vi, and I do always like Vi into things like Orianna, because again, we, we saw this earlier in the day, once the Flash is gone, she's a very easy champion to lock down, but yeah. Jarvan into Syndra, I also think is really good. Like, these junglers uh, can do a great job of locking these things down, but BLG trying to solidify their top side, and they have a lot of strong uh, picks in terms of the early game with Syndra and Zaya, and then giving Bin a comfort is super important for them. Yep. Yeah, exactly, because last game, something that was not draft at all, that was the top lane matchup, and Zeus really, really destroying Bin with his Gnar specialty counter pick into it. And Ooh. this time around, oh, this is an older counter yeah. into the Jax. The, the, the belly bump uh, tactic yeah. for Jax for the Counter-Strike. There's a lot of mobility skills across the champion roster in League of Legends, yeah. and Kragus' big old belly takes priority over pretty much all of them. As long as he's going forward when you're going, he's going to stop you and do the damage. So very, very powerful champion, especially if you know the matchups, you know the trading patterns. He can be very difficult to deal with. Blitzcrank, Caitlyn, band away here in the second half. Once again, it's BLG keeping Gumayushi off the Kate. Yeah, very, very interesting. Seeing as how the Senna was just pretty impactful this last time around, I guess BLG are like, you know what? We level one invaded, and we really messed that whole situation up. So <laughs> I guess they're accounting for it that way. Karia is such a good Tom Kench, though. Um, loves being that, that frontline engage, and we saw it last time. But the thing is about Senna Tom Kench, if you're on red side and you're saving him for the last two picks, one of them has to come first, and then you can't get the other until your opponent has a chance to interrupt it. When Senna and Tom Kench are popular, they're kind of best friends. They're BFFs down there in the bottom lane. They like to hang out with each other and not really anybody else. So I'm Ooh, curious if they'll what? still go for it. No, they won't. The Jinx locked in for T1. Um. Yeah, I don't... <laughs> How do you feel about this video? Uh, we did see a Jinx earlier in the tournament. Was It It was KT that I think played it. Um, and I'm pretty sure it was in the yesterday's match against LNG. And I think the problem with Jinx in, in the current meta, she's a really hard AD carry to play when there's so many things that can dive onto your backline. Uh, she can be a challenge. But I guess with things like the Jarvan already on locked in on the side of T1 with the Gragas disengage as well. They're confident in their ability to provide peel and protection, okay. but if this Jax Alistair ever gets on top, like th that Jinx is dead. There's no way that she's playing this game. Yeah, there is quite a lot of peel for it, and and the lane still looks pretty good considering it's a Zaya Alistar lane that they're playing into. There's some more guaranteed targeting of the yeah, possibilities for Jinx that Jinx. Jinx is not going to have fun, man. It's Arcane all over again. We're about to get a sneak peek at season two. What do you mean, man? You right she was now. the main character of that show. How can the main character not have? Okay, it's, Tom Kench is a good answer. Yeah. It is also pretty good at putting some pressure onto the Oriana. I want to see if there's not a level one that's similar to last time around, if there's more attention paid to this mid lane, because both these mid laners, very, very possible that you can burn summoner spells super early on and try and force ganks with these junglers. All right, I love it, man. Active, powerful early junglers. We got the counter pick in the top lane, the old school style with the Gragas into the Jax. Ori versus Cinder. This is probably the most evergreen mid lane matchup in the history of League of Legends esports. I feel like this is one of those ones everybody's seen so many times. But the Jinx, and specifically the ability of the Tom Kench to keep it protected, is probably the biggest thing I'm going to be looking at. Yeah, I, I actually love watching Ori Syndra too because 
there's so much how you can swing it in the early stages of dodging those cues and and positioning just a little bit more aggressively up front too but of course that all teeters on do you know where enemy jungle is so see about those raptor wards about those deep uh early safety nets i wonder if we're going to get any level one Activity. I'm gonna say no game. on this one. <laughs> I'm gonna hazard a guess. Are you kidding? You think you go back down after that? <laughs> <laughs> well, it uh, certainly skewed the early game of this uh, this first round here in this best of three. BLG really, really wants to avoid that situation. Bring us to a game three. Keep their chances alive at avoiding the competition tomorrow and getting the early ticket to the quarterfinals. Yeah, I think they do definitely at least need to get some early info on owner. The Jarvan could start a snowball himself. Definitely could throw a wrench into things here. All right, a reminder to everybody out there, connect your League of Legends account with Prime Gaming to grab the exclusive experimentation emote. You can do that right now. Get yourself connected, get your emote, start spamming it on people whenever they do something wacky in lane. How do I get the Braum one? <laughs> that seems to be the most popular. <laughs> we are the wrong people to ask that yeah. question to, Kobe, but I respect your confidence. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you trust the two of us with that question. As Zay is just walking it off, he wants to get away from Ben, who gets that last little hit. So, hey, a little extra HP from Grasp. Love it. Okay. The value here. Carrier also going to take a oh, nice he didn't little put the ward down. I thought that his goal there was to get the ward on the red to see where this Vi was starting. T1 donating some, uh, some early health pools here. Yeah. They're not off the members of T1 that are going to miss them the most with Gragas <laughs> and Ace Sustain and uh, carry a tankiness. But nonetheless, it is going to be BLG again going to the same red buff that they went to last game. Yep. <laughs> this time around, though, they're on blue side, so yes. it's there. But the squad is there. Yeah, the you squad is there. BLG's like, I'm watching you, T1, yeah. just in case. We know that this is something you might do because we did it ourselves. But admittedly, uh, Elk and On realize that in the 2v2, they're not getting early push. Tom Kent's Jinx, the range yeah. advantage. Tom is a really. Um, Alistair's not the best level one anyway. In Tom fact, he sucks. Let's worse. just go he ahead and say it. You can <laughs> say that. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, Tom Kench is a really great bully, so Elk and On getting late to lane uh, is not the end of the world. The level 2 should be coming through in a minute from uh, these bot laners. But yeah, I wanted to go back and talk about this uh, mid matchup a little bit more because uh, the idea behind Syndra into Orianna is that you have a range advantage, right? The, the Q means that you can often out trade against the Ori in lane. Um, the thing about Ori though is that early laning phase, you can already see she's starting to get this push off. Yeah. Uh, and when it comes to early skirmishes, Syndra is very terrifying because of her ability to set up for the gank, right? The QE, you can already get it at level two with a Vi coming in as well. Easily able to force a flash out from someone like an Orianna and a Jarvan in this matchup won't be able to match that same trading power in the mid lane uh, two versus two. So this is a lane again that BLG could really find advantages in if they can be active in uh, the mid lane. And, and the reason I, wa I love watching it so much is because it, you can ego on them from the other side of it. We've even had Orianas getting oh, yeah. the solo kills on the Syndras. That's true. Especially if you have unpredictable movement, like walking towards it and dodging some of these cues and, and move up on them. So definitely one uh, that's very tiltable, as we said. But full clears for both junglers mean it's a calm early game. No extra influence here. It's kind of one of those things that we talked about uh, in game number one, Vettius, where we were like, oh, yeah, I can't wait to watch top lane, and everything was bottom. We're like, oh, man, look at these junglers. It's Jarvan and Vi, and they can both do so much. And they're like, full clear. Let's go ahead and just get those economies rolling. Yeah. Ben doing a good job, though. Gets his grass bop, even as Zayas goes for the belly bop. Winning the mana war here currently as they both eat their biscuits. So as a reminder, oh, hang on a second. Might have to hold off on that as Jun navigates his way around Ooh, the vision. I like, I like this. We talked about the gank setup early on. Faker has no idea. Jun coming around. There's the stun. Scatter the weak. Faker tries to flash, but Yagal's got him for first blood. Counterattack from owner, but doesn't look like there's a whole lot to get here. Nah, the, the Jarvan's probably not strong enough for this. Owner loses his own flash. That was a little silly. Yeah, they're going to be able to rush down the wave still here, too, with Faker teleporting back. Yagao is so good. That was beautiful. Able to set him up. He kind of lures Faker in. Faker goes for the command attack, and you guys are able to get him, throws the W, hits the stun, lines it up for Shun so that Shun can then have his flash for Faker's flash and secure that kill. Really well done. Yagao, probably 
one of the least hyped up members because he usually, <laughs> to your point earlier, Vettius, you know, is playing a lot of Rome uh, style champs and setting up uh, teammates, but him getting first blood, so nice having Syndra get the early advantage. It's just also a lane that you can snowball. We already talked about it earlier, right? A lane that you can be active in early on. The fact that Shun choosing to sacrifice the crab because he saw an opportunity to make that play on the Faker, navigating around that vision, just very well played. BLG being active in the early game is the best version of BLG, in my opinion. And the play is very straightforward. Low mana on the side of Faker as well. That auto attack from Yagao flying yeah. as he flashes too is actually the, what cements the kill as uh, Jun is able to flash after and provide that damage. Been getting kind of low, but I don't think he's too worried right now. Keeping my eyes on the minimap as well as to the presence of the junglers. Ona pathing away as he moves towards his wolf camp. Bin? No. <laughs> no. Is this saying don't? That does oh, he yes. is! Oh, it does! Oh. Zeus went back in thinking he might find an outplay, and Bin just beats him on the head with a <laughs> stick. Uh-oh, no flash Faker. Faker doesn't get hit by the scat of the week, but it doesn't even matter. The unleashed power should be enough. Faker's just buying some time. Beautiful from BLG in game two. Now this is BLG. Bin, I thought he was just saying, don't you dare come for these minions. And I guess he was. <laughs> but then Zeus <laughs> yeah. still dared for it. Body slam just inside and really good. Uh, from Bin, activation time there. Pops his counter strike, gets the kill. Simultaneously getting the repeat gank onto mid too, punishing the no flash here. That's the, the snowball you're talking about. They're so vulnerable, these, these mages, when they don't have it. And it's going to be a knock on effect. Dominoes here will start to fall. Shun picks up the dragon as well. And you look at Ona and you're like, where can you do anything, right? Maybe you can look for a kill in mid, maybe, but Yagao still has the flash. And if Vi is there, you lose that two versus two. Top lane doesn't really have an, a, enough damage or options to be able to find a play in. Chinx, Tom Kench, is this really a lane that you can enable in the early game? T1 feels very stifled, and Ona's kind of responsibility is to mitigate BLG's early options, but that hasn't happened. BLG have found great plays in mid and a big confidence play for Bin. After getting solo killed in game one, he now finds a solo kill for himself on one of his most comfortable champions. All right, let's see where our junglers end up getting involved once they hit level six. You can see those EXP bars on the side of the screen creeping ever closer to that point. Both of those ultimates incredibly effective at setting up some plays as Bin wants to go in on Zeus, who knocks him back into the cask. But the Jack's still so strong, man. Hang on. Such an iconic pick for go. Bin, and he's not afraid to use it. Zeus gets killed again. Bin is just tearing him apart. Yeah, I was thinking Zeus just used everything yep. in the first engage, and then he just waits around and stands there and watches them, watches the minions. Bin doing such a good job. He always gets <laughs> his counter strike off, gets his auto attack off as as the body slam has been coming in. And this is the repeat gank. You're asking where's the level six of the jungler is gonna go? There, I believe there's a few more seconds still as, as we get back to life left on Faker's Flash, maybe. Um, yeah, a few more seconds, but uh, looking back at this kill, very clean, very easy for Bin. And yeah. We talked about a confidence play. You can see the confidence shining through for him now. Two kills top, two kills mid. The top side of the map dominating for PLG, a 2k gold lead already eight minutes in. And the pings are coming through for Harold. And what can T1 do about it? The truth is nothing. Yeah, there's kind of this big bad Jax up there in the top lane that is just not allowing anything to go down. 64 to 47 in the farm. It was the Gragas picked after seeing the Jax locked in. This was the answer that T1 said they wanted to go with, and Bin just seems <laughs> to know the matchup better. Mm, angry Bin, he's gonna do everything. Get a couple of solo kills, go start up that Rift Trail for you. Meanwhile, on making his roam mid through two to get priority. That means bottom lane's left open, T1. Small window and a nice bit of communication here from BLG. I think. Elk, Elk knows he's in danger. He's going to go. Oh, he's face, face checking. Check it. Face check into the brush. Whoa. The feathers fly. Okay. Owner disengages. Okay. Got his team coming. Damn. I, I wasn't expecting. I thought he'd drop a ward. I, I, <laughs> I didn't think he'd use his face to check it, but there we are. Uh, Elk ends up being alive. So good news for BLG fans. They're still in the lead. And uh, they hold control over the objectives. First Herald, first Dragon. Everything looking up for BLG. And if they wanted to, they could drop that Herald top lane. They don't necessarily need to unlock mid right now. Why not just accelerate Bin? We talked about how difficult it's going to be for Gumiushi on this Jinx to play these late game fights. If uh, you're this low mobility AD carry that doesn't have those innate dashes, yeah. it's only going to get harder if Jax gets as fed as he's currently getting. On the other side, maybe just uh, 
let Ben uh, stay in his arena and <laughs> also <fun>. true. <laughs> See about the rum time time towards uh towards that bottom lane though that we're talking about with yeah. Scuttle Crab coming up with Minion Wave pushing in. Tom Kench though, carry his level six. It's just such a good denial pick. T1 trying to play some stall game, but BLG's pace that they've set is very quick for this game with all the extra kills that they've been fed super early on. They certainly will have the ability to snowball this. Yeah, two kills plus a Drake, or four kills plus a Drake for a 2K lead. Excuse me, just 10 minutes into the game. Total gold on the left side of your screen. You can see BLG, BLG, BLG at numbers one, two, and three. Not a very good sign here for T1 as the Herald is summoned up in the mid lane. That's going to give even more money to Yagao. So far, it is just the uh, BOG show. You know, coming into this second game, we were talking about how it feels like T1 to go to 2-0 this series. BOG looked out of sorts in game one, but they're refining their form. Of course, still a lot of this game left to go. T1 do have pretty decent scaling, especially yep. with this Jinx back pocket. A single good fight with Gumiushi picking up a number of kills could be all they need. You look at the farm as well. 114 CS, he has a 30 lead. Massive. On has been roaming a little bit to assist with the top side plays, leaving Elk kind of vulnerable to ganks, meaning that he has to play a little bit more defensively. So I wouldn't count T1 out just yet. Obviously the other game going heavily in favor of PLG, but uh, we'll see what T1 can do to turn the game around. Yeah, it's a good point, because On actually came into this tournament with the, one of the highest roaming time supports in the game. Oftentimes it is, it is Elk having to uh, make his own money and he's been quite good at still dealing plenty of damage, even on a lower budget, though. I'm really going to be looking for that first big fight where we have, you know, four or five players from each side in there, because that's really where Jinx has the opportunity to find those pop-offs that you're talking about, Vettius. We need to see resets turn into stats that make up for the gold difference that BLG has earned for themselves so far in the first 12 minutes of the game. Until then, the Gumayushi farm train needs to keep chugging along the tracks as T1 is going to start up this Drake. We'll see if they can get it before BLG can interfere. Bin and Zayus just scrapping up here in the top side, as now we are going to see a TP coming in, but it's from Yagao, who just picked up the Leandries. Owner's going to lose the opportunity for his combo, and the Dragon's going over to T1. But what about the fight? On trying to get away. Guma wants to get excited. Beautiful engage on the Yagao. T1 may lose their jungler, but they're going to get three, and a Drake back for it. It only takes a single fight, and Guma Yushi finds himself two kills. PLG, why wouldn't you feel confident walking into that fight? The problem is you're a little late. Yagao TP's in over the wall. It means that PLG are a little disconnected in their engage. When Jun goes in, T1 can all immediately collapse onto the jungler of PLG, find that initial pick, turn it into a 4v3, and then chase down the remaining PLG members. I want to point out the position of the DPS. Look at T1, Faker and Guma. When Shun goes in, to your point, they're immediately onto him. And even though Guma's getting bounced around, Faker's able to do so much damage that owner's able to get that kill, and then they run them forward. This front-to-back play from T1 was clean. And already that goal gap is starting to shrink. And crucially, that bot lane that we talked about earlier, two kills now for the AD carry of T1. I said I wanted that first fight with four or five people from each side to be meaningful. And there it was, T1 finding their opportunity. But the problem is still the top lane for them. If you're looking at what's going on up there, Bin could be a serious issue. And if you're BLG, that's something you know you can play around as the game goes forward. Oh, it's going to be caught by Shockwave. He could not live through it, and Faker's on the board. BLG just got Karius Flash, but T1 got Ons life for that one. He no longer had his Flash from the previous play. And T1, they're retaking control. Still behind in gold, but they're making play after play. But we've all seen it where the wind gets taken out of your sails, yeah. right? PLG were moving cleanly around the map. They had a dominant top side, they had a dominant mid, and then off of a single kind of lackluster dragon, they immediately concede another pick. And you can see now that like, they've kind of lost that control. It's not over yet. Oh, nice catch, BLG. More money on Yagao. MasterCard Lane Economy snapshot shows Guma might be the one with all the cash on t one side, but Yagao's even further ahead for BLG. And I love this from BLG. Don't slow down. Don't kind of 
let that control shift in favor of T1. Remember what you were doing, Jun and Yagao is still a powerful duo, and they punish Carrier for the flash that they found earlier. They hold on to the gold lead for now. The Herald is spawning in a few seconds, and I imagine this will be the next objective that both these teams look to fight for. And you can see the lane assignments here, trying to send Jax to go answer Orya on the bottom side for uh, BLG as that objective does come up. We saw this one in its entirety. Something to note though, Faker did flash offensively for it. it and those offensive flashes can sometimes oh, be blind. tricky. <laughs> he just yeah, control ward there. Oh, but back at live, we have a TP coming in. It looks like the second Herald could be a point of contention here. T1's already got five bodies in the area. Bin has TP, he could join up for this if BLG want to challenge it. Chompers are great to block off that little pathway from the river into the blue side jungle. So it looks like BLG are just gonna take it. They'll trade it away for Bin grabbing the tier one turret there in the bottom lane. 15 and a half minutes into the game, the plates are down. So Bin can do a lot of damage to this thing very quickly. Mid lane tier one turret, taking a little bit of damage from T1. Low enough now that the Herald should be able to break it. Scatter the weak onto two. Carrier having to get away, pops the thick Ooh. skin to survive this unleashed power that likely would have killed him otherwise. I see a lot of pings, uh, blue pings here up towards Faker. So they're sending a uh, contingent of BLG members a lot to of go dudes. for him and to teleport. Okay, TP's in there. That's Bin. That's the one they got to watch out for. Owner tries to stop him. Zayus is ready to join the fight. He TP's in now as well. Both top laners going to have synced up unleashed teleport timers here for the next time that's available. And that was BLG being like, you know what? Remember that offensively flown Faker Flash in mid lane. Let's try and pick him off, but yep. that's a tale as old as time. People trying to go for Faker, T1, he just pulls back. The rest of the team is there. And now we got a reset for Dragon. Only 35 seconds means you better get your control ward now. No TPs available for T1 mean that this should be a window for your guy. He's actually gonna stay for another wave or not. He's a bit indecisive, um, but it's easy for him to join the fight. Good vision setup from T1 around that neutral. It always makes me suspicious when the observers <laughs> zoom in on an AD carry. Yeah. Like, What's about to happen? What did he miss? Yeah. Uh, oh, nice sidestep there from Elk getting away from the zaps. But right now, it's just this fight over the mid wave, right? Yeah. Do you want a first to it? They'll push through. You can see Zayas has made his way down. And uh, Bean has actually chosen to stay top, so they can't fight this now on. Oh. If Owner had that timing slightly different, you can interrupt him when he's in the air from the blast cone, but and, no worries. And I like these calls from BLG because they want to play to where they are winning, the side lanes. Bin had an advantage, and Yagao had an advantage. But their AD carry, they are they are outgunned. Well, can he oh, do enough? Does the nice. wave clear? Yeah. Um, but they're outgunned, so they didn't want to take the five on five versus Guma Yushi, who had a, a BF sword to the long sword previously. Now we just had a recall for Elk, and Elk is able to go even up the inventory, but it's at the cost in, of your tempo. To uh, the tier two. The yeah. top tower still lives as well. Gumiyushi's excited, but all right, they're going to back away from it. Playing they don't want to get collapsed on. They know that Bin is moving around. He's no longer top. He's no longer pressuring the tier one. All right, no fight. Kyria takes his place next to Gumiyushi but once again. This is a timing for BLG to actually start pressuring that tier one in mid. But with the range on Gumiyushi, he's going to have enough wave clear. Faker. Nice, the shockwave going to catch on, force out the ulti there from the Alistar. That's all they're going to get, though. Trade of ulti, shockwave for the unbreakable will. Look at top, though. You see once again Shun hovering around Bin, looking for a potential play, maybe a dive. But no, it looks like with the wave clip from Zest Flash. Oh, owner just flashing in, looking for the damage here onto Elk. Nearly finds him. Super Mega Down the Rock. Oh. Elk gonna get it. But the flag will be planted on the corpse of the enemy AD carry. BLG trying to get away now as they will not finish off owner. Meanwhile, Bin and Shun not gonna get anything topside here versus Zayus. Beautiful stuff there. Karia is there to save owner as he goes in and kills Elk. The Jarvan pick into the Zaya, so clutch there. And that's going to be the tower on it. At, on top of it. This is this is supreme control Even from game. T1. I'm surprised that Elk held on to his ultimate for so long. Look how much damage he takes before he throws it out. He does have flash himself. He could just flash away here to safety. Gets hit by the uh, zap. Now he ults. At this point, you're just guaranteed to die. And then Carrier with the flash devour means that the Jarvan lives. There's no way to get that kill because he has the shield. And uh, frankly, a bit of disrespect coming out from Elk. I feel like he had so many tools to live there, um, but he didn't want to burn them, and he ends up burning them all anyway. Yeah. 
fla early flash the Jarvan Cataclysm and just try and take that worse cooldown trade, but at least keep your life. Yeah, I mean, Ona forced him into a, a very difficult situation, uh -huh. right? Which he was, burned it anyway. Yeah, it's one of those situations where I'm going to flash, but now you have to flash. We think you're not yeah. going to have it for the next fight. Um, and that the idea is good there. Ona, that's all he's trying to do, get those summoner spells out. He wasn't ex planning on getting the life, but he'll take it. Now a T1 of basically equalized the kills. You talked about how it's an even game, Flowers, and T1, it definitely feels like the momentum has swung in their favor as BLG is only really getting control over the side lanes. And Gumayushi is getting Infinity Edge completed. So the Jinx is going to be more of a problem than ever. I feel like if you want to kill him in one of these fights, the only way to do it is if Karia stands too close to the Jinx and you get a two-man knockup from the Alistar, two-man stun from the Counter-Strike. Some way that you can kill him before the Kench can devour him because Gumayushi is a problem. And with T1 continually starting out these fights by chunking down on, I mean, last time they even got his ultimate and half health him, but now he's, he's behind them with a big flank. He's looking for the flying beautiful two-man stun. Gumiyushi gets hit by it. On's coming around from the side. Guma's got to be careful, but Shun flashes back over the wall off to the left, keeping himself alive as Elk is trapped in the Cataclysm here yet again. The feathers fly. Ona tries to stay alive. A dunk from the Super Mega Death Rocket. A double kill of a Gumiyushi. He's excited, and he just can't fight it. T1 are turning this game on its head and suplexing BLG right back into their base. A disconnected fight is punished so cleanly from T1. Faker, he ended up being the target of Shun's ultimate because he knew that the Devour from Carrier was going to protect the AD carry. He thought that he could catch Faker off guard, but T1 responding kind. BLG don't actually follow up, so keep your eyes. Good stun here from Yagao. Shun turns his attention to Faker, but there's no one there with him. It's T1 that collapses first, then on locks down Carrier. Meanwhile, Kumayushi is completely safe on the back line, while it's Elk that gets assassinated by the ultimate from Kumayushi. Guma Jinx stays safe the whole time, turns around the double. Beautiful stuff from them. I mean, it's so difficult because there's a Tom Kench right next to the Jinx, and then Faker has the crown of the Shattered Queen, so then he ults over there, and, and Shun's forced to flash out, as you say, with no health. They kind of lost the, the fight right at the beginning. You want to talk about no health? Two fights in a row now. Owner has walked away with 100 HP remaining on his Jarvan, <laughs> playing around his limits superbly on this engager. The one thing, or the two things, that they did uh, get in that fight, though, are both of Guma's summoner spells. And Guma yeah. had been holding his summoner spells very closely, uh, really relying on Karia. Now that those are both down, maybe they can do something about this Jinx. All you have to worry about now is the Tom Kench ultimate and the rest of the peel from T1. Well, man, if I'm looking at BLG win conditions right now, I'm looking at the man on my screen, Yagal, 4-1-0 and zero on this Syndra. We've been seeing him hit Scatter the Weeks left, right, and center this game. I feel like if BLG want to stop the momentum swing that T1's been earning for themselves, Yagal's the man who's got to do it. And I think that they have to commit to the split push. Bin has Hole Breaker built on the Jax. That's where they got their early leads. Him getting back-to-back -back solo kills. Bin has got to do Bin things. He has got to take over. He has got to create pressure and kind of force his own win con on the game. Problem is, T1 have an easy answer to that, and it's called Baron. You start that objective and you say, listen, do you want to take this gamble against Chinks Oriana, we're going to melt this objective. If you don't TP in, then we're going to secure it. They get the TP and then they can leave or they can even choose to take the fight if they feel like they're in a strong enough position. So I feel like that they actually have answers to mitigate this split push, and this is where I start to get concerned for BLG. Right now, they're taking more objectives on the map they can, but they still haven't been able to break open this mid-tier one, which would give them so much more control over the enemy jungle. Yeah, well, there you go, that top lane tier one gone. Finally, the gold lead was back in BLG's favor just for a second, but not really any longer than that. It's so even here in this game. T1 being on soul point now. The next Drake should be highly contested, I feel like, just because the power of that soul can be so overwhelming. Of course, Cloud Drake is one of the ones that becomes more subjective depending on the team comp, depending on exactly which champions you have available. For something like Tom Kench, it can be super strong because yeah. you become just an F1 car once you had devour somebody. I am the speed. Yeah, like, you're just crazy fast. But we'll see exactly what they want to fight over here next as Bin is trying to keep that split push dream alive. Meanwhile, the rest of BLG just keeping some control, some vision here in the top side river. They do not want to allow that Baron to go over, specifically because of what you were talking about earlier, Kobe. Now I just want to see the Formula One catfish. <laughs> <laughs> Garia certainly uh, would be quite the driver, you have to think. 
but it's it's kind of hard, I guess. You know, Bin, even with the hole breaker, Gragas just kind of holds the wave in front of tower. Zayus is why you pick the neutralizing pick of the Gragas, allowing the, the rest of T1 here to wait out and buy time for Guma's double summoner spells to come back up. He already has the ghost, only a little bit left on his flash. And T1 can try and pull off that team fight again. And when you're talking about the Gragas being a neutralizer, just stopping the Jax by surviving, he's got the two powerful active items that do that. The Everfrost, the Zonias. These are great at buying time to be able to stop Jax from doing what he wants to do. On level 9 on the Alistar, lowest level in the game right now. We've been talking about how he's been getting chunked out, even having to blow his ult before these fights start. As now they go in after Owner, but nicely buffered. Guma Yushi survives the unleashed power thanks to Karia. The counter explode you button. Uh, <laughs> this is a large part of why they picked the Tom Kench into the Vi and into the... Uh, oh! Oh, but they go back in. Now they're going to look for Faker, who has to try to get away. Headbutt pole will be flashed out of. T1 will keep both their carries alive here. On tried to predict the flash there from Faker. You saw the W in and then On actually matched the flash. Unfortunately, he was a little bit short. Couldn't quite connect on to Faker, which means that Faker will get away with his life. But BLG feeling a lot more confident with their mid control. They're moving towards the Baron now. No way they're going to start this one off. It would be madness. Nope, okay. But maybe that is BLG. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that prediction, though, that was so close to working. On was thinking Faker's going to go right towards his tower, yeah. but Faker's angle on his flash, a little bit more down the corridor, not directly back towards it, so just on the outskirts. There's a reason he's the GOAT, man. Just those the smallest things can make the biggest differences. True. An elusive goat. It's very <laughs> difficult to pin the way down. The you Baker. said that is different from the way that he said it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, but there was like an inflection thing. I don't know. <laughs> He's, uh, Kobe's implying there's some goat trying to hide around the barnyard. Right. In yeah. a Have you place. seen the mountain goats up on those oh. tiny cliffs? Like, it is crazy. Oh, right. oh, the oh. They're trying to catch owner this time, but instead, it's on. And Gumiyoshi's unstoppable. They found Yagao. Shut down for Faker. Enemy mid, dead. Enemy engage, dead. Baron is the target for T1. T1's going to get that for sure. Unless Shun does a crazy miracle, but they're sending Zeus right for him. The two bouncers here, Karia and Zeus, going to make sure he's oh. getting nowhere near that thing. He's not getting. Nope. An opportunity to even try. Oh, but they got him with the tongue lash. Oh. Elk has to flash over the wall. Elk with a potential massive outplay as Zayas goes into the stasis, but he keeps himself alive. Gumi Yushi is dominating and Bin will not find the stun here with a counter strike. They got the Baron. They got back in the mid. They kept everybody alive. T1 have grabbed control of this game. Unbelievable. The early game was so dominant from BLG, but we talked about how they only need a single team fight. Owner finds the play. On thinks that he's caught Owner off guard. The Gao and On, they think that they see an opportunity, but look at the minimap. The rest of PLG aren't anywhere near. Nice flash from Owner, the follow up from Carrier, the kill from Faker. Everything is so clean. And then you see here, Shun trying to get something back, but it's just not enough. Yeah, they try and push down mid, and then Elk here looking for the big burst play with the Blade Clawler. He flashes it through, but Zeus has his Zonias able to get over to Karia. Karia devours him. Faker as well with his Zonias or stopwatch. Not quite sure if he had finished it there. Just Whatever. the stopwatch it's is broken. A it's a It'll be thing. a Zonia soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But here comes the soul. So much denial there from T1 and Guma on this Jinx that we were skeptical. And champs are like, will he be able to stay safe? Yes, the resounding answer from all of T1 is yes. Faker with his crown shattered. Okay, owner with the engage, forcing the flash out of Yagao. Beautiful flag and drag right back out over the wall. Bin gonna be the target now as On looks to try to provide some disruption. Shun back over with a ball breaker, but he ain't gonna find a whole lot. Re-engage from Owner. Stop watch to stop him in their tracks. Oh my goodness, it's T1! Just absolutely rolling over him. Double kill for Guma, triple kill for Guma. Owner picks up another. Ben's the last man left alive, and he's going to walk home with a broken leg. T1 absolutely dominating. T1 barely walk away with a scratch. The damage is completely 
mitigated. Stopwatches, Devour. Carrier didn't even use his Devour in the fight. I mean, Goomba, Goomba flash forward for a dead person to try and get a Quadra kill. It was crazy, <laughs> just a one-sided fight from T1. We talked about how they've been ramping up throughout this tournament, and T1 are here to play. They're looking to secure a spot in the quarterfinals. And they're looking to do it in convincing fashion. This game is Guma gets excited, the visual novel. All right, <laughs> they start. They started out on Baker and just look for the first kill. It's it's a heavy target on Shun. He does have a stopwatch, but the zap hits before on goes for the engage. There's no DPS follow up, and once again, these supports have been walking loop pinatas, especially on on the Alistar. Going down, Guma gets excited. The rest of them chase forward. The front line for T1. Oh, hang on, back in the action. Back in the action yet again. Shun trying to get away. Super Mega Death Rocket not going to find the target, but Guma Yushi finds the kill on Elk instead, and they'll happily take that. Bin trying to disengage with a leap strike back to his jungler, but now he's going to be thrown up in the air by Owner yet again. Shut down over to Guma Yushi. T1 may have just won the game. Another convincing fight for T1. BLG just, they, they have no options in the fight. T1 are just consistently getting the better of them. Shun is forced to retreat. The TP now coming in from both Zayus and Faker. T1 are ready to end it here. The early game was tough. The top lane was rough. And for BLG, it was not enough. T1, the greatest team ever in League of Legends, is ready to bring it back and do it again. They're on the Nexus, and they're on their way to the quarterfinals. A bit of a revenge for MSI. T1 a will bit. take this series over BLG. Kuma Yushi, incredible performance on the center, 11. Zero, three, and just listen to that crowd. This man, hey, he was the main character from Arcane in this <laughs> game. <laughs> I'll tell you that. That he was. The crowd fully in support of T1. And again, you can't talk about the AD carry without talking about the support. Carrier back-to-back top -back yes, games. Wow, what a performance. Um, but let's see what, up what adaptations have they made coming into this. And uh, how can they match up against BLG? Rematch of the MSI uh, best of five, where we saw BLG get the better of T1. And, All right. And I want to see what style BLG go for, because this is this is one of the few teams that still held on to, like, let's have a Fiora top lane for Bin. Go ahead, True. pick whatever you want. Let's have Shun play Nidalee and Kha'Zix and oh, these no, assassin Oh, no, don't remind jugglers. me of that draft, man. <laughs> I'm no, just no, throwing no. it out there. It is always a possibility with this team. Yeah, you got to set the stage for possibilities at the beginning of a series, right? Anything could possibly happen. So let's see what we got in the bands. It's Maokai, Nico, and Jax, banned out by T1. BLG getting rid of Renata, Zaya, and the Rumble. First pick of this one will be Jax. Jarvan for owner. I like the rumble ban here. Give Ben a little bit more freedom uh, from this red side. The Renata ban does suggest that maybe they're looking at an early Alistair or maybe even an early Nautilus. The Orianna being up, Yagao going to be grabbing that for himself. Having a, spoken a little bit more to Hysterics, one of the things I debated with him is PLG have felt a little slower in terms of their oh. early game prowess, even in their series against LNG where they ended up falling short. Game one, they were very dominant, but as the series went on, it felt harder and harder for them to find those early game advantages. And I did wonder, is it because of the shift in the mid lane meta where Yagao doesn't have as many mid laners to be able to unlock and roam around the map? And now that he's being put on the Orianna, I wonder if this favors a T1 where you do get to scale a little bit more and go for those team fights. But then again, BLG is one of the best team fighting teams <laughs> in the world. So uh, yeah. we'll see they, how T1 fare. They certainly have looked their best when y Yagao can just go help Bin and and Elk in the, in the side lanes and, yeah. and Bin and Elk just go sicko mode on the game <laughs> and, and duo carry it, basically. But we shall see here as the Azir has picked up an answer uh, to the Orianna. See if Faker also is a Hell of Blades Azir enjoyer. Seems like that has really been taking preference so far. And with Jack's band, guess what? Our triumvirate of the top lane. Ooh. Never mind. Zeus, no. Zeus, okay. Yeah. Zeus with some pocket picks of, you know, Kennen, Jace, and Nar possibilities. I like it into the Renekton because it's more of like, look towards later stages in the game. And T1 going to take a little bit long view. It's also just part. like, it's such a good Zeus pick. He's such an incredible Nar player. 
I also always love it with Jarvan because Cataclysm into Mega Nars, you get just more area to try and crash people into. Yeah. Well, let's see. How many see. power picks are on both sides here? Yeah, it's kind of impressive, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, Rel Oriana on the side of BLG, Azir, Jarvan. Obviously, we haven't seen a huge priority of Azir, but the Hail of Blades. Azir is something we saw from Showmaker very early in the tournament against Caps, and it's an ability, f it gives you the ability, rather, to get push in that lane, out-trade the Oriana using your long range. Uh, so we'll see if Faker goes for that direction. But top side of the map has been a high priority. Of course, this Rel can still be flexed. So now the bot lane will be targeted, and unsurprisingly, BLG are going to start banning things away. The Alistair going to be taken away from Carrier. Don't think we'll see a Bard ban, but you've always got to be prepared <laughs> for it in case Carrier chooses to bring that one out again. All right, support focus, man. The Alistair, the Recon, like you're talking about. Are we going to continue with that here in this second part of the second half of the bans? Let's see, taking the time to think about it. No, getting rid of the Caitlyn instead, the long-range marksman power in the lane. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, you think about long-range champs that often pair up with Azir. Ezreal and Caitlyn are two very prominent ones. Caitlyn also gives you a very strong bottom side of the map, and Gumiyushi, uh, he's been known for a pretty good Caitlyn performance here and there. That's all right, yeah. yeah. Oh, definitely showing that respect towards him. Will T1 look to ban away further AD carries, or will they actually... Oh, they're going to choose to remove the Sejuani so that they can limit that Renekton Sejuani strong top side of the map. So they've taken away a lot of the tanks, but not the Poppy, so... They could go Rel plus Poppy and have a very, very strong front line. Uh, and the Poppy also could have pretty good W value versus all three of the T1 champions at the moment. But they want to jump on the Kai'Sa pick first, it looks like. Oh, the center hover. Oh, oh, T1 yeah, boy. Give me more. inspired by North America, perhaps. <laughs> Oh, yeah, really you have a classic NA-inspiring yeah. Korea. Yeah. <laughs> I think the last time that that actually happened, and it was T1 picking up two, was all the way back to 2016 MSI. Aframu. Aframu, exactly, for CLT. Oh. But... Hey, hey! Oh, Told you! <laughs> Told oh. you so he can pull it out whenever he, he can, wants, he baby! Can. He has the card! Yes. You can pull the Nidalee card whenever you want if you are Shun, and it's with the Renekton, okay? For those, the best combo with the Nidalee. For those that don't know, that don't get to watch the LPL that much, Shun is a very well-known Nidalee player. This is one of his comfort picks, something that even earns respect bands domestically in the LPL. Uh, when they used it against LNG, I didn't love it. I was <laughs> a big fan of it. Um, but let's see how it works out today against T1. I mean, I'm a resident Nidalee hater. I feel like the champion can often run into a lot of difficulties, but the situation where it always works best is with guaranteed CC to set it up oh, for the yeah. Spears. Renekton when, Nidalee. Exactly. When it has something like Renekton, point and click, you can't really mess those up, and it makes it easy for the Nidalee to get in there and get the ball rolling, because she needs to stay ahead of the pace of the game. She needs to lead the way in terms of tempo. If she falls behind, she's a really cool ranged minion. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Really cool, though. She's a really <laughs> difficult champion to play. You kind of want to get off the gate very early, stealing away camps, leveraging your mobility. You could bully a Jarvan. There's very little he can do against the Nidalee, but you need that priority in lanes, and uh, I don't think T1's going to be looking to give it anytime soon. This is why I love this team, though. BLG has so much swagger. They're always willing to pay these hard-to-execute picks. I want to see the early jungle path here and how aggressive he can, he can take because that top side of the map, that is BLG territory, okay? I mean, Zeus versus Bin, a top Great lane matchup that I think everyone is excited to watch once more. These two players are some of the best in that role. And you can hear the support for yeah. T1. <laughs> NA versus EU earlier was, it, the crowd was hyped, they were enjoying the games, but now the home crowd <laughs> favorites, they're in the house. It's always fun to hear those differences when there's one of the home teams that fans just love in the building. And it's T1, man. Even like yeah. the most popular team in the world. Yep, yes. exactly. All right, a reminder, you can log into your Riot account on lolliesports.com and watch Worlds live to earn exclusive Worlds emotes and icons. That's right now. It's live. Go do it, lolliesports.com. But let's see how this early game is going to play out now because I'm so interested in this Nidalee pick specifically. How do they enable it? How do they get it going? So the beauty of what we get to see is we actually saw this bot lane matchup earlier in the G2 NRG series. Uh -huh. And the range the advantage. Highest level. The highest level, <laughs> yes, yeah. Yes, of course. Um, uh, the range advantage that this center Tom Kench does give you in the early game is that you can really uh, have a lot of control in the bot side of the map. Interestingly, BLG going for a bit of a delayed invade here. Yeah, owner. 
but be under pressure as you can see. They see it marked with a spear. The three-man invade coming out from BLG. Crash down. Not gonna find anything other than the red buff. Now they're backing away. Red buff still at about 1,000 HP. Owner taking some damage, gets ignited, has to continue falling back. Shun still trying to find a little bit of poke oh. here. They engage. Oh, nicely catching Owner up, but now Shun's gonna back away. Owner with a flash out, trying to stay alive, but now Elk is under pressure, down to 100 <laughs> HP. They're nearly gonna kill him. It's first blood back over to T1. The invade crashes and burns. Now Shun has to try to get away. The flash is already down. Can he escape the power of the Kench? He's been hit with the lick, the flash of the wall. How many licks to the center of a Nidalee Pop? It's only gonna take one more. Shun falls. Karia grabs the second kill of the game for T1. And he ain't done yet. Gumayushi's coming in. Karia's got a red buff. On is continuing to be slowed. T1 may have just won the game in two and a half minutes. Oh, oh wow. wow. On barely lives, but Karia is a monster. Another knockup coming out as Elk. He shouldn't die here, but he's nearly oh gonna be killed. Oh my goodness. BLG thought they were being clever, and T1 smacked him right in the mouth. We literally saw this matchup earlier, and once they get ahead, they become oppressive as all hell. Yeah, we Carrier. might have to throw out this data. I don't know. <laughs> with, 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 the, with the way that level one went, this is gonna influence the stats. Oh, uh, it is. My goodness. The idea from BLG is to delay invade and believe that you can win out on the three versus three. But the engage from on whiffs, his, his W from the uh, from the rail actually collides with the wall. And once they don't have that initial damage, then T1 can just use the range advances. They also got a bit of sustain coming out from Gumiyushi, the Guardian from the, uh, the Tom Kench as well. Yeah. But then in the extended fight, T1 came out ahead. And while Ona did lose his red buff, I think you can quite clearly say that this was worth it for T1. <laughs> yeah, definitely so. And Faker, I, I believe he's the one who came first, even with the Conqueror, not going with the Hello Blades mid Azir. So uh, definitely all things pointing towards T1 here. Now, let's see, as it settles down, as it calms down, you have to keep track of all the summoner spells that were blown in it. If you had a plan previously coming into the game of top lane and looking towards Renekton plays and flash stunning into spear combos, you have to think about bottom lane now with so many people blowing their flashes. Yeah, lots of stuff down. Now. Are there any summoner spells still remaining? Kumi Yushi has his flash on just about to get that ignite back up and ready to go. So plenty of vulnerabilities down here. Shun able to secure the second crab. Bit of an oh. engage. There comes the Abyssal Dive, but now the counterattack with the crash oh. down. The spear goes wide. Gumiyushi gets away, and now another counterplay coming out from Owner. But Carry is killed instead. BLG are on the board. The game's not done yet, boys. Yeah, very smart. You have to pay attention to that bottom lane. They return to the scene of the crime, Vedius. That they <laughs> do. More crimes. They're looking for a dive. I think that with Owner and Gumiyushi, Gumiyushi's very squishy here. Gumiyushi only 350 HP. Shun trying to tag him with the auto attack, slow him down first, but he misses the spear. Gumiyushi can escape. Owner's back underneath the tier one turret. Remember, everybody's still only level three, level four. Owner jumps in, here doesn't hit Faker. the knockup, but now Faker's ready to clean these guys up. Level five is here. There's some damage potential there, but Yagao's coming around behind him. Faker's gonna chase these guys out. They can disengage in time, but now Faker goes in after Yagao. He's got the higher DPS, so he'll try to use those soldiers a little bit. Man, what a crazy early game. Yeah, I mean, some of these spears are reminding me of Kadrill's Lee Sin Qs, you know, <laughs> with the direction that they're going I right now. I thought Yankos was just... the meme. Is, is, is oh, no, I mean, Yankos has much higher hit accuracy than some of the Kadrill Qs in his history, see, but that's I fine, see. that's fine. So we can see this initial play. The Q does go wide from Shun, and it's a it's a good promising engage from T1, but the re-engage from on, the spear goes wide, but it doesn't matter. Gumiyushi's forced to flash. Admittedly, he doesn't have a huge amount of damage this early on in the game. We talked about how Nidalee can just bully a Jarvan out of the early jungle, and that's because of how much stronger she is in those early skirmishes. And while that EQ can look lethal, Nidalee in the extended fight will come out on top. So it's six minutes into the game, and Shunda also hasn't based, uh, by the way, on True. this, this Nidalee. He's going to go for another clear. Raptors pro possibly into the Krugs as well for a big, big buy. 
All right, no action again for now. Just a little bit of poking back and forth. This game has led us to believe that anything could happen at any point here in the first you know, six minutes. It's so funny every time we get into matchups like this and we're like, mm, the top lane. <laughs> Zayus versus Bin. Everyone's super amped to watch those two compete. And then we have a look at top lane. Dead even in farm. The lane is neutral. It's the team fights where we'll really see their impact, whereas the bot lane is where the chaos is rampant. Faker once again makes his way out onto the minimap, moving into that fog of war, creating that sense of pressure that Elk and On have to worry about. Jun has finally been able to base, has picked himself up a first key component. Ooh, nice Mega Nar into the wall there from Zayas, just trading aggressively with Bin, hops back into him at the crunch. Bin still getting away, wallop doesn't hit, no more follow up there. Of course, just trying to put as much damage into him as he can, with Bin still having both the Flash and the Dominus, there's not really any true kill potential there. Yeah, also we just saw Owner go into the bottom side river to grab the crab and get that extra vision. So they know after the full clear from Shun, he's going to head back on down towards this bottom side. They saw him just grab that ward by mid lane. The mid laners have just been farming, so they're fine with all this, but uh, they did get an alert, so both of them should know bottom side presence. Now. We've seen a lot of early action, but credit to Ona. He's, yep. he's oh, hang on, Ooh. bot lane play. Shattering strike, nicely done. Caria forced to flash out of that one just to escape, but now they're looking for an angle with Owner. On still trying to get away, back into the river. Shun and Elk falling back to their own tier one. They disengage in time. Owner can't get in there from an EQ. So just a bit of testing the waters, you know, looking for an opportunity there. The flash being lost from Caria. But the gold advantage still sits in T1's favor. Shun once again looking for something. We're back. Both but junglers. They can't see it, right? If we get an opportunity to toggle that vision, that control ward is limiting that uh, what T1 can see right now. Gumiyushi has no mana. Here it just got six, though. Yeah, OK. Yeah. They're not going to take that fight anymore, and they're going to nope. disengage. Herald and Dragon both up on the map. Both these teams have their eyes set on the bot lane. And it looks like no early objective going to come through. Yep, Karia just trying to jump forward, keep the pressure on here, use those tongue lashes to try to poke at these guys. We talked back when we saw this matchup the first time in the earlier series today. The sustain from the Senna creates such an obnoxious lane state to have to deal with. It's so easy to just constantly try to take these trades if you're the Tom Kench. Go up, trade Tongue Lash with something else. Eat a Void Seeker for a Tongue Lash. Senna's going to heal it off. Gentlemen, how crazy. You know, you've already had your big upset today, but is it NA that's also innovated the bot lane meta? Have they found the answer to things like Zaya? It might just be the, the the energy special, man. Uh, we'll take credit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, it, it's for sure been getting scrimmed by a bunch of teams, but I'm down. I saw NA play at first, Kobe. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> I, I'm feeling in a good mood, so we'll accept all credit here. 4K help, though, on this Herald, and Shun six. is watching. Yeah, okay. six Every, everybody's coming. Yeah. Oh. That is a little bit further, but or uh, Kaisa, but it's a party. It's a party up here in the top side river. The Herald, not going to be taken down just yet. They're going to smite it away. Owner picks up the eyeball. Everybody came to the party, but now we're all leaving to go do our homework. Karia finds a tongue lash onto Yagao. No more follow-up here just yet. Nice root coming out from Guma Yushi. Now they're going to go in. There's the Wombo combo. T1 ain't going to kill anybody just yet. Yagao barely gets away. Owner's ready to swoop in for the Cataclysm. And on gets turned off. Guma Yushi flips the switch. And now Shun tries to fire back. Massive double kill over the top. Guma Yushi is shooting straight. Senna's going to get some bans in the future. I can feel it. That is three kills all in the hands of Guma now. And T1, let's see. They're pushing topside. They're pushing mid as well with Elk. Trying to fish around. There's a ward on him, so he's not going to be able to interrupt Baker here. Should be able to finish off the cannon and push that one in too. That fight looked a little chaotic initially for T1. And you'll see here, once they go into the fight, like, the response from BLG is good. Like, yeah, the, the shockwave comes through, CCing uh, Faker on with a response as well. Yeah. Owner's not in the fight yet. It's when Owner re-engages that it starts going in their favor. And I was worried for Gumiyushi stuck here on the front lines, but he had so much health back. And then he's able to disengage, find that snipe, and the crowd erupts here in Seoul. Yeah, it's kind of funny how Guma ate the tank, you remember? Uh, ate Owner, and yeah. uh, Guma's like, all right, fine, I guess I'm <laughs> flashing out. <laughs> But Gary was like, you know what? I'll be next to you more in the future in the game, so I'll be able to protect your flash. Look at the gold here, picking up three kills in the bot lane, leading alongside Faker. They are identical right now. And he's only at 13 CS. The center doing wonders for T1. Yeah. 
total damage. Zay is topping those charts, but it's pretty easy to do when you're Nara gets the melee. Flashing forward, Mega Nara in the wall, wall up, rock toss, one more hit, will do it! Zayas solo kills Bin! This ain't no finals, okay? This ain't no finals. Zayas is locked in. BLG are trying to respond, but they may be getting collapsed on. Yeah, Karia comes in with the Abyssal Dive. They're ready to reinforce Owner and make sure that he doesn't get jumped by the members of BLG that were looking for a play. Void Seeker not going to really do a whole lot here as T1 can just walk it off. I really do want to put more emphasis onto Zayas, though. He did so much work when T1 had such a hard year losing Faker for so long. Really, owner was, or uh, Zeus was doing overtime, trying to keep them together, and very, very good recovery from this team to be able to make it through playoffs, make it here to Worlds, and especially on these types of picks for Faker, the Azir, the Nico, definitely their comfort zone. I mean, T1 have just set themselves up fantastically. Elk in oh. a bit of danger. They're looking for another one. Carrier goes in for Elk, forces him to try Uma. to play defensively. Guma has so much range, so much damage. Elk is going to get rooted up. He pops Ooh. the cleanse to escape that ulti. Nice play there from Guma, really leveraging the range to his advantage and bullying this Kai'Sa out on trying to respond. It's so difficult to do when the Tom Kench is right there with the Devourer ready for the save. If On would have committed, they could have immediately countered there with Karia, no problem. Rift Herald summoned up here. They're looking for plates, and I don't think BLG's gonna stop them. Already grabbing that first one. There's another one going over with the charge. Don't think they quite have enough damage to get the fourth after the extra resistances have been added, so they'll walk away from that. But it's a two and a half thousand gold lead for T1. Guma found like 10 stacks in that single skirmish. He was just constantly hitting onto his opponent. Yeah, I just clicked on the souls to try and check in. He's already 49 right now. It's kind of a shooting gallery down there in the bottom lane with so much action starting from level one. And in the context of this comp, oh, Zeus, he's going for another kill. Okay, no, he's going to show restraint. He did have a two level lead. I really thought he'd look for the dive. I guess he doesn't have full information yet. But you look at these little wards in the enemy jungle. Moving the wrong mouse. <laughs> uh, you can see these just littered to get a bit of information as to where Shun is, giving Zeus the freedom to play as aggressively as he wants. Uh, but let's look back at the solo kill. And he's doing so well because Nar's going to turn into such a powerful split push and team fight presence for Team One. I believe, too, for live right now, I'd like to. I wonder if there's a, a picture in picture we can see for the dragon setup because T1 uh, are in a really prime position to start setting up the objectives. When you're getting Zeus solo kills like this, um, when you're winning team fights, think, well, there you go. There it is. Reveal. Uh, yes, easy setup for them, uh, as expected. Dragon number one. It's a, it's decently late into the game, but uh, they should be able to snowball pretty effectively. Their position around the dragon is the dragon is dead. Yeah. Nice position to have when you're looking to get the That's game. That's what I was expecting. I guess we didn't need the picture in picture pop up to confirm. So oh. coming into this series, I look back at all of T1's games and against TL, they had a difficult early game. They couldn't really do much. Against Genji, they actually had a pretty solid early game, but then it was the team fights where they ended up falling short. And then against Cloud9, they ended up looking incredibly clean from start to finish. And it feels like throughout this tournament, they have just been ramping up as they often do when they come to international events. You know, this team in the group stage, has their worst record ever is five and one. They only lose a game. Wow, that must be so <laughs> horrible. Like, well, that, like I was they, told this is a Swiss stage, not a group stage. My <laughs> point is, though, that this team has already lost once to Gen G, and they are saying we're not losing anymore. That's and the roof. That is the roof. Yeah. And uh, coming into this series, they are looking strong. Their early game is looking good, but BLG are known for their team fighting, their ability to play the 5v5s, but with the gold advantage continuing to grow, it might not matter as yeah. T1 is in a fantastic position. I mean, T1's still stinging from MSI. They want revenge over BLG for that elimination. BLG taking them 3-1 and kicking them out. So definitely have a bit of an ax to grind on their side. Let's all remember, too, the level one that started out this game. Um, definitely, that was a lot of variance in that level one. And this is going to be a long series. And you bring up the fact that they were eliminated by BLG back at MSI. Remember, this is not an elimination game here today. It is a promotion game. You guarantee a spot in the quarterfinals if you win this one. But the loser will still go on to play in that last chance set of games tomorrow. Three best of threes, back to back to back. Show's going to be starting a little earlier, so make sure you tune in. 5 a.m. CET, 9 p.m. PST. But T1 now being challenged in this topside river as BLG move in to control the Rift Herald around the spawn of the second one. 
They don't want to lose out on more neutral objectives here. Baker has TP, but I like the look of that bottom push. They should just buy time for Baker. Push that wave all the way in. Yep, just waste as much of BLG's time as they can. Karia and Gumayushi are so annoying to deal with right now. The Senna has so much range, and you pretty much got to throw enough at him to overcommit to him twice because of the save from the Kench. Yeah, so annoying. I mean, the Tom Kench constantly just walking up into your face, bullying you off. And it looks like that's going to be all that they need with Bin going to answer that bottom wave. T1, they rotate Faker over to mid and collect another objective, simultaneously taking the Rift Herald and mid lane. Just beautiful stuff from T1 here in this first game in the best of three. Objective bounties are available soon. That lets you know the state of the early game here, just 17 minutes in, and we've already got ourselves what looks to be a four and a half thousand gold lead. I mean, I'm just looking at that comp as well, and it, from my perspective, this was like a very difficult game for T1 to lose. Like, they have such a massive range advantage. Sena is one of the best scaling champions in the game, period. Mm. And when you pair that up with an Azir, you know, we talked about earlier some examples of long range champions, Caitlyn, Ezreal, two really strong long range champs that work so well at playing front to back. Sena works in the exact same way, and her range is only going to get longer the longer that this game goes on. So I feel like BLG are going to have to find some miracle fight or a big throw from T1 to be able to turn this one around. Yeah, and when your Nar is solo killing and has a ginormous lead over the Renekton, oh, yeah. that is going to be a lot more useful. Yeah, like you have no options in the sideline. You feel like your team fight options are limited. You, the push, like you can't contest it anywhere. That's it, why they picked Nidalee and went for a level one. <laughs> <laughs> T1 are in a commanding position right now. They've caught bot, they've pushed that in. They've caught mid, they've pushed that in. You look at top as well, Faker having some cover from Ona. This was where we saw some blunders from them uh, against Gen G. Gen G found some great windows to punish Faker when he was pushing in these sidelines. And he has been left isolated for the time being. Yeah. But he's going to play safer as a response. Yeah. And so much safer, too, for the uh, for the Azir in those matchups on the side lane with Dragon coming 30 seconds and Faker still having. Uh, his teleport. I don't know exactly how many seconds left on you, Gauss, and how that's going to match up with the dragon, but it probably should be up by dragon time or pretty close. 15 seconds until that Drake. It is important to remember what you noted earlier, Kobe. It was a pretty late first one, yeah. so it's not going to be a fast soul stack even if they go 4-0, but you know that BLG doesn't want to allow them to just continue taking everything on the map for free. It is still a 5k gold advantage, though. It's so hard to take a fight in open ground, especially when T1 already have priority over this bot lane river real estate. Zeus is in position in the bottom lane. He's pushing up. Faker is back on the other end of the map, pushing up topside, but he's got his TP ready to go to join. Oh, Looks he's like, joining. Yeah, right. he's riding. Here comes the fight. BLG feel like they need this. All right, keep your eyes on On. That Rel Engage would need to be absolutely nasty to win a 5K deficit team fight. Instead, they're going to decide against it. BLG will walk off, having watched T1 take the Drake. I mean, BLG. We're kind of in our position, just acting as spectators on that dragon. They didn't even try to cross map anywhere. They didn't even try to do anything elsewhere on the map. They just wanted to try and find a fight, and T1 gave them no angles. Absolutely yeah. none. They were funneled into that choke point. BLG didn't even try to get push in bot and then access via the river that way, because I think they were so scared of Zeus with the pressure that he was generating. Like, all three towers are up. They have full control over the map, a 5k gold lead. BLG are running out of answers, and they're running out of answers quickly. Yeah, I feel like they got draft gapped, they got level one gapped, they got top gapped, they got bottom gapped. It's, it's gaps everywhere, but yes. yes. So many gaps. <laughs> so many. I, I don't know if there's a word for that, a collection of the, gaps. The whole game is a valley yeah. right now. We have, we have found our way into quite a gorge here, gentlemen. A great word, an excellent yeah, word. Yeah, yeah, one of the ones you don't get to hear too often. At this point, T1 can start playing around the Baron. They don't have the fastest Baron. I mean, of course, with the Zia, it's never going to be the slowest. But uh, I guess right now they're looking to play for that tier one in the top side of the map. They want to try and move their vision, get control over mid, and then start threatening that tower. But BLG are pretty committed to defending it. They do, of course, still have Zeus's TP. They could look for a play with that. But here we are. They're looking to chip away at this tier one. Well, those chips are going to be pretty intense once the Herald has it comes its the way hammer. with the turret. There it goes. Yep, just immediately smashes that thing down. Three to zero now in the turret count. T1 absolutely owning the rift in this first game. K1 
Carrier takes a bit of damage, but he doesn't care. It's so easy to just keep using this Kench as a brick wall. Harold's gonna get ready for the second charge. Kaboom! It connects. And because they were able to move so far forward up in the jungle, mirroring that same progression in the top lane with the Herald, they pushed their opponents all the way back, took control of the enemy jungle, exfiltrated safely. But it's not even just that. Look at the bot lane as well. Zayus keeping this pressure up controls the bot side jungle too, has that control ward. There is that single ward for a potential TP flank, but that isn't an option for Yagao right now. And T1, they control the top side, they control the bot side, they're replenishing their wards, they're spending their money. Two items now finished for Faker. A second in the works for Gumayushi. Yeah. And everything looking up for T1 here in the game, game one of this series. It's just so incredibly hard for BLG to find a time to fight because you're down on these item power spikes, but also it doesn't get better for you if you wait. But there's a pick! Zeus getting jumped on. They're throwing the kitchen sink at him. Beautiful shutdown from BLG. That's the wrong side of Summoner's Rift, buddy. Little Mininar wandering into the dark forest here. That's the time to go for it for oh, BLG. Yeah. But really, what can they get with that pick? I mean, it's so difficult even with getting a person advantage because your side lanes are both constantly pushed in by T1. So they don't really have objectives to go for, and they're even under attack as T1 continue to push in 4v5. Shun's health just yeah. brought down a half after Gumiyushi laid his sights on him. Four members actually putting pressure on the BLG. Faker with the damage. Yeah, Faker now disengaging alongside Owner. They don't want to end up getting caught in too lopsided of a fight before their allies can move over and reach them. They do crash the wave into the mid lane tier two. None of those tier two turrets yet demolished. Remember that top lane tier two was the one that took the damage from the Herald, so it's still pretty low. Backing away now is on with the Owner? Hex Flash, finds Ooh, Owner, that forces out the Flash from the Jarvan. That's a big summoner spell. That could have been lethal. Uh, if he had died there, that's a barren start for BLG. And even though they find themselves behind, it's worth the risk, especially when you're not playing against the Smite's Owner. He needs to be careful, but he will get away with his life for now. T1, continue to play the patient game. We're going to look back at this pick from Zeus. You just have to look at the minimap. He's overextended. He, yeah. uh, he shouldn't have been there. The rest of his team were nowhere near. There's nothing that they can do to punish elsewhere on the map. And uh, just a mistake from Zeus. Even the best make them sometimes, but T1 is still enjoying an incredibly favored game state. You can see the gold difference over time presented by AWS, just showing how it's been this up and to the right movement in that blue line for T1 ever since the very beginning of what you mentioned earlier, Kobe, kind of a, an aberration of a level one. Yeah, and the only reason we're not going to see T1 go turbo mode and continue to push is because they also have the luxury you know, of this late game. So there's no reason for them to risk anything versus BLG, who have been able to work miracles out of uh, other teams rushing fights towards them. So they'll continue on stacking those dragons, even though it is a little bit of a delayed pace. Maybe we see the point where uh, Zeus' priority on his split push on the side lane, bottom lane, does result in a setup for the Baron. But I think only in a very secure setup would T1 actually go for that. T1 have pretty good turn off of the Baron. So after collecting Dragon, they might try and turn their resources towards that, do a 4-1 split push, and whoa, never mind. Whoa. BLG fight now. Shun just goes over the wall, and I'm pretty sure he doesn't want to be there anymore. Flash back away just to escape from Zeus's Gnar. It's sole point at 24 minutes for T1. I mean, I'm, I'm getting a little frustrated with BLG because like, they should just be trying to cross map. They should just be using multiple members topside to at the very least get some bounty gold back because you're, you're in a situation where if, if you feel like you need to force a fight, then trying to funnel through that choke point at blue, that's the second time you've now tried to do that and T1 have just made fun of you. So. I feel like that BLG, if they do want to come back into this, they need to be finding other things on the map rather than just running face first into T1. Well, they're running into them again here as they try to find something. Once the owner of Gumiyushi, not going to get anything back. And as Gumiyushi just keeps farming all these souls, building that range like you were talking about earlier, earlier Vettius, every single one of these attempted steps up is going to become more and more punishing as you take oh. more and more Senna shots in trade. Bin going in, looking for Zeus. Meganar back onto both targets. Elk tried to swoop in there, catch him off guard with a killer instinct, and Zeus just walked away from it. That opened a window mid. All right, they're going to be able to push at least half of it. BLG, this is the moment. All right, TP coming in. They want to try to stop this, find a punish. Knock up on two, coming out from owner. Guma usually looking to disengage back up towards the top side of the jungle. TP coming in now. T1 regrouping. 
low health bars on BLG. Zeus is taking towers right now. Zeus did not join. T1 said, we're fine without you, buddy. All right, pin is low. Still lots of free firing damage coming up from Gumayushi. Remember, there is no ulti available for Alcon. And goes in, finding a magnet storm onto three, but he ain't gonna find any kills just yet. On is gonna die first. They take out the jungler second. Ben ain't gonna get it. Shun is down. T1, run them over. The range is lethal from T1. Four versus five. BLG just can't even get close to T1. And when they finally do, Carrier devours his mid laner and brings him back into the fight to wreak havoc. Carrier, he's oh, not done. Oh no, he even stops Bin's recall. If he gets this croc here, there it is. Abyssal dive takes him out. And critically, this means his respawn is now desynced from the rest of the team. <laughs> the lick hit confirm on the W. Tom Kench claims another. Let's take a look, because look at the mini-map during this replay. Honestly, while T1 are taking care of business, really good cataclysm into EQ out there from owner. The NAR is just taking towers on bottom side, and then they make the call with this ward here. Teleport in, they go for the turn. T1, they turn it around. Red buff is picked up. Carrier goes in. The shockwave doesn't do much damage at all. I mean, it's just a massacre. Bin's not even really in the fight either. They didn't have ultimate for him or for Kaiser because of the play they tried to make in the bot lane. And uh, wow, then wow. Carrier is able to find wow, this. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> He's able to find this kill onto Bin. Just a one-sided stomp from really beginning to end from T1. That was the only promising opportunity that BLG was able to find. And T1 handled it with calm patience. And uh, now with the Baron, they're looking to siege. All right, let's see how long this base can stand. Top lane tier three turret is already down. So there's an open inhib available if T1 just want to rush it. They still got this power play for Baron from another minute and 40 seconds. The minions will do enough work under the inhibitor here in the top side themselves. Zay is about ready to transform. Magnet Storm was used for a whole lot of nothing. Owner's got Yagao locked down, but Owner's gonna drop instead. They'll trade him back for the mid laner and Shun falls too. Now it's two inhibitors down and a 4v3 for T1. The souls are all over the place, but they're the souls of BLG players as T1 is not stopping here. Elk may have been the one to take out Owner, but now the push just keeps going. Zayas will grab another on Bin as Elk has the killer instinct right back into his own fountain. He flashes away just to live. <laughs> T1 just stop BLG in game one. Gary is having fun too. Oh, he is. <laughs> I mean, from start to finish, what a great performance from T1. We talked about it earlier in the cast, but it does feel like this team has only ramped up throughout the tournament. Their debut against T1, uh, TL was a little bit shaky, but from game to game, it feels like that they have gotten better and better. And we're looking at an informed T1 today. Man, oh man, T1 coming out swinging here in game number one. To hear more about it, let's go ahead and toss back over to the desk. Thank you so much.